Good morning, everybody. Myself, Dr. Ratima, on behalf of Dr. Lalpath Labs, welcome you all for the session. Today we are here to talk about a highly contagious and infective disease that is tuberculosis. About one third of the world's population has latent tuberculosis, but people infected with TB bacteria in their lifetime have only a 10% risk of falling sick with tuberculosis. However, people with compromised immune systems, such as people living with HIV, malnutrition, or diabetes, have a much higher risk of falling ill. We, are, we all are here to discuss various parameters to diagnose the disease and henceforth the management of this dreadful disease. 24th March is celebrated as the World TB Day and since 1995, more than 22 million lives have been saved and 56 million people cured by WHO recommended treatment and cure. Vast majority of TB cases can be cured when proper medication is provided, especially in cases of multidrug resistance. To discuss upon the current trends in management and treatment of tuberculosis, we have with us Dr. Animesh Arya, who is a renowned senior consultant, chest physician, with more than 25 years of experience in all aspects of respiratory diseases, especially tuberculosis. He has an extensively worked in New Delhi TB Center, RML, Patel Chest Institute and currently working with Sri Balaji Action Medical Institute at New Delhi. He will take us through the history of tuberculosis to its global burden and mortality, its infection and the journal principle and approach to treatment. For the live audience, we need to inform that approximately 1000 doctors are registered on the webinar. So the questionnaires can be taken at the end of the session. While for the audience who are accessing through the webcast, you are requested to raise a query on the screen. We will be answering them at the end of the each session. We welcome Dr. Animesh Arya. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ratima. And, uh, I'm really grateful to Lalpath Lab for having given me this opportunity to come here and discuss on the current trends in management of tuberculosis. As we all know, that tuberculosis is a global burden and it's mounting every day in its uh, infectivity and the people who are affected more and more so with a more dreaded complicated form of tuberculosis that is MDR and extensive drug resistant tuberculosis. And in fact, the theme for this year's World TB Day was that we reached the 3 million people of tuberculosis in the world which are missed by most of us as practitioners either working in a government sector, a national tuberculosis control program or in the private sector. So the global burden of per year of tuberculosis is about 9 million cases per year and we miss one third. The aim is to find and treat and cure this particular missing link and add to the uh, decreasing infectivity rate of tuberculosis in the world. And the tribute goes to Robert Koch, the historical discovery by Robert Koch in 1882, 24th March, when he discovered uh, tubercle bacilli, the staining method, the zeal linsel method, and we are still practicing that particular method in over uh, more than, you know, uh, so many years. And we still find the most useful method to find TB bacilli in a given sample for particular patient of tuberculosis. Simultaneously, he developed the tuberculin for testing for hypersensitivity or the immune status of an individual and soon followed the discovery of x-ray. So the tuberculosis diagnosis became very, very efficient and more accurate by these two discoveries. However, the diagnosis was followed by a lag period of nearly 60 to 70 years before we had a real good treatment of tuberculosis. And since then, the tuberculosis has remained a global challenge and is still a global challenge in 2014. It is not only the clinical parameter, but it also draws with it a lot of humanitarian grounds, public health uh, outcry and economic burden to the society with more than 2 billion people uh, afflicted all over the world. So seeing that, if we look at the global burden, what Ratima pointed out, 
2 billion people in the world are infected that is one in three population in 2012 about 8.6 million people fell ill with tb and 1.3 million died in 98% of these people died in low socio economic status countries and india ranked one of the top 5 countries in that so we share a huge burden of tuberculosis of the world and still very little by way of achieving the cure rates are being achieved in our country and 2012 Five lakh thirty thousand children became ill with TB, and seventy-four thousand children died of tuberculosis. A huge burden of childhood tuberculosis. Four million new sputum-positive cases every year are added to the population. Out of the nine million people, about forty percent are sputum-positive. Imagine the burden of infectivity the person is carrying around with him before he comes to a treatment protocol and he is seen by a practitioner either in the private or the government sector. MDR prevalence is increasing, and so also its XDR. It is around four percent. It may vary from four percent to fifteen percent, depending on the geographical variation. And it accounts also accounts for one third of all HIV positive deaths. It is also top three causes of death among women up to fifteen to forty-four years of age. But all is not what spells out is that bad. We have achieved great success in managing tuberculosis. in if you would be surprised to know global incidence of tb is falling but we have not yet reached the desired target rate which is set by world uh, uh, health organization or the stop tb program that is the millennium achievement by 2015 or 2050 when there should be a less than one infected case per lakh of population and the tb death rate has significantly dropped 45% between 1990 to 2012 so most of the advances or most of the thrust of the treatment has fallen in last you know two decades where everybody has become aware there is a global challenge which has been taken on by who and the various national programs doctors there is a huge talk of public private partnership in treatment of tuberculosis and if you read the press in last 15 days there are three big articles by head of the institutions of big institution in india particularly dr somya somanathan dr uh, Uh, Ratnavelu, that we should partner with private practitioners in managing tuberculosis because 50 percent of these patients are seen by us as a private practitioner, rather than seeing most of them in the public sector or in the government sector. So, and 22 million lives have been saved by using DOTS, which was uh, uh, basically the uh, improved program in 1994. And if you see the prevalence and the mortality, it is. definitely falling but the target is in 148 and whether we achieve this target somewhere in 2015 or maybe later it is yet to be seen and similarly the mortality is falling so we do have a downward trend but we have a resurgence of drug resistant tuberculosis difficult to manage tuberculosis and difficult to catch the lost patients of tuberculosis india just to sum up the burden we account about 1/4 of the 8.6 million cases of tb it also accounts for the third of the lost cases or not so diagnosed cases there are 75 new smear positive cases 1 lakh population per year over 1000 deaths due to tb a remarkable increase and two deaths every 3 minutes of untreated or treated tuberculosis in india but uh, it is possible seeing that that about uh, tb is going away but we see mdr tb and more than 15% of these cases of mdr or multi drug resistant tb occur in india and of this about 10% are extensive drug resistance that is they are at least resistant to four good chemotherapeutic agents of tuberculosis management and we are sharing this burden with the community in the hospitals and exposing ourselves and our population to risk of developing this acquired drug resistant disease which is very 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 difficult to manage so these are the basically goals and the stop tb partnership has declared that probably elimination of case that is one case less than one case per million population and 50% reduction in tb prevalence and deaths by 2015 2000 just approaching so whether we will be able to achieve with correct drug treatment management protocols preventing spread of disease preventing relapse we'll see that in next about 30 minutes or so just to see how tb is spread just to recap it's an airborne transmission if you are effective immune response it is localized to one place in the lung usually an infection then is if it is insufficient goes 
to uh, uh, spread to all over the body the various parts practically every single organ could be involved the most common are of course the lymph nodes uh, followed uh, of course after the lung the peritoneum the abdomen the spine uh, and serious tuberculosis and none of the area is immune and it can escape detection in extrapulmonary sites because they are usually possibly vesicular cases and we do not have efficient methods of diagnosing extrapulmonary tuberculosis making it progress and the patient usually presents late with complication or disseminated tuberculosis that is more than one site being occupied by tubercle bacilli and varied manifestations as uh, dr ratima pointed out that we have a 10% risk of active tb after exposure to tb so it's not too less it's quite high that over a lifetime period we may be having a chance of developing tuberculosis if our immune system is not apt we go down in immunity either by an immunosuppressive agent either we develop diabetes or if co infection with any other uh, disease particularly hiv and if untreated many of the patients may die within 2 years after contracting tuberculosis and of course if you treat still you have deaths as we seen about uh, 3% people dying and about 70 or 1000 deaths every day in india so that's pretty high so if we with that background of high prevalence of tb and we have a diagnostic methodology which uh, dr shalab is going to dwell upon so i'll not go much into detail of the diagnostic approach will we go more on a pragmatic approach to treatment of tuberculosis the general principles in india what has been the progress of treatment of tuberculosis when we studied md in 1983 to 85 we had only a national tuberculosis program and the success rate which was reviewed in 92 you can see the figures it was so dismal 30% patient diagnosed of the existing population at that time and of these 30% only 30% were treated successfully so only 10% of people were actually being treated or cured of tuberculosis leaving 90% un uh, responsive or not cured or not taken into the program so a re uh, thought was given a revised national tuberculosis control program pilot project was began in 1998 it was scaled up about 450 million population was covered in 2001 and 2004 80% were covered and 2006 entire country was covered with rntcp and we have seen that the dots program combined with rntcp has saved many lives decreasing the mortality still we have a long way to go ahead so we have made progress and though much progress has come up in only last two decades but we have made good progress and particularly with new devices or new methodology in diagnosis we should make further progress in achieving an early diagnosis and early cure now this is a statement out of the international standards of tb care and we have a standards of tb care in india which is launched in 24th of march just about a week back on the world tb day and there are certain standards of care which should be provided by each practitioner to a tb patient whether he comes to his clinic hospital or is seen as a government setup so we bear a moral and you know responsibility for tuberculosis in assuming a very important public health position prevent ongoing transmission and development of drug resistance these are the two aims we always work upon and we must prescribe an appropriate regime utilize local public health services assess the adherence this is most important the compliance and adherence to prevent first of all to sterilize the uh, make him uh, sputum negative and to sterilize and prevent relapse and resistance and address poor this adherence also when it comes if the patient is defaulting or not coming the treatment that is the most important aspect of treatment you should uh, see to it that the patient follows your treatment very diligently so there has been a change in the uh, diagnostic protocol or the algorithm of uh, diagnosing tb patients in revised national tuberculosis program and further it has been modified only 2 years back the threes have been replaced by twos and if you say initially it was cough for 3 weeks or more you had a once per three sputum examination and if two were positive you treat if only one positive strain you get an x ray if it is positive then you treat if it is negative there is non tb but most important is most of the patients are either not subjected to sputum examination or you do not have a quality sputum diagnostic center or you are probably too careless to send him to a good diagnostic facility so if there is three negatives you give antibiotics 
if the symptom persists, you do an x-ray, it is negative, it is possibly non-negative negative, uh, for TB, but you still follow him up and if it is positive, it is classified as smear negative and you treat. Now, what has been the change? This has changed to all the tools. So, you have two weeks, you have two sputum examination, you do not wait for the third sputum examination, you straight away go and if you have two negatives, you follow the same protocol and if you consider it could fit into smear negative any time you start the treatment as smear negative or uh, category 3 treatment. And there are new definitions of cases of tuberculosis. New cases, all new cases who have never been treated, relapsed, who has declared cured of treatment by any form of TB or if there is a treatment failure, that is if the patient who on the treatment remains sputum smear positive or became smear positive at the end of the uh, 4 months. So, who continues to be positive or becomes positive, that is a uh, failure treatment and treatment with default, that is the patient has uh, not taken treatment if there is a transfer in from other facility or others who do not classify in this category, because this is important to categorize treatment in a revised national tuberculosis program, whether you want to give a 6 month treatment, you want to give an 8 month treatment or you go for an individualized treatment with drug sensitivity and drug susceptibility testing. So, similarly, this classification is based on the previous cases that is 1, 2, 3, 4 and uh, if you have uh, one is all sputum positive cases, new uh, sputum smear negative cases, pre seriously ill, new extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So, all forms of you know basically positive or equivalent to positive cases and category 2 is relapse cases or who are failure cases who return after default or basically you want to extend the treatment. Category 3 is relatively milder cases, but the treatment remains the same and category 4 is probably chronic pulmonary tuberculosis or MDR or drug resistance or XDRTB. So, the aims of treatment are first to cure the patient, prevent death, prevent relapse, to decrease the transmission of TB to others and prevent development of acquired drug resistance. And as I mentioned, we have uh, just launched standard or STCI that is standards of TB care in India and this was launched on 24th of March, though there will be a lot of uh, webcasts on this uh, uh, standards of care in the web and we can have a copy through tbcindia.com through uh, uh, the web. So, the DOTS was introduced in 1994, the DOTS stand for directly observed treatment, uh, supervised or short course and where the patient comes to the center, takes the treatment intermittently every alternate day for 2 months and then he is given the treatment, there is a follow up, very strict follow up. If you do not turn up for treatment, the, there is an immediate evening recall to the home of the patient. If you do not again show up on that particular day, the person goes to the person's house and administers him a therapy at his house and asks to come back to the center as soon as possible. And that has achieved more than 85 percent compliance and nearly similar cure rates in DOT therapy. That is why we have very good thing. Only problem is adherence now. Patients still fall out of dots and that is why we have a relapse, a failure and a drug resistant TB that is important. So, based on uh, the standards of TB care, these are the various subsets of uh, treatment. How do we treat that the appropriate treatment, first line treatment, extra pulmonary tuberculosis, we must monitor treatment by sputum examination on appropriate test, look at the adverse reaction we must have a proper recording and reporting, that is important. What has been told by government in the press that we as practitioners do not keep a good recording, we do not monitor the patient. We are very good at prescribing, we will prescribe, we will ask the patient to come, but unfortunately patient does not turn back, we do not have a recovery protocol, we do not ask the patient, we do not call the patient back, neither we have a record of the patient. So, we have unfortunately landed him into a loss to follow up could be a treatment failure or a relapse case and going into need a category 2 or category 4 treatment. So, it is not that uh, we are good at prescribing, but we are not very, very good at follow up the patient that is very, very important. So, what we have as an armamentarium, I told you that uh, uh, since the discovery of tubercle bacilli and x-ray, we had very little except for good diet, maybe sulfonamides and uh, certain other uh, non-pharmaceutical agents, but discovery of streptomycin gave birth to a new era in treatment of tuberculosis and finally, when uh, 
uh, ethambutol and rifampicin came. It was initially thought that we should be able to cure treatment, uh, cure the TB with rifampicin isolated. There were a lot of trials based on British uh, uh, Medical Council, Hong Kong trial, the East African trial, and there the short course therapy was well established and treatment followed a good course, but there was a decline in uh, cure rate because the follow up was not good, the implementation was poor. And unfortunately, we do not have any new drugs since last 50 years which can be taken as a first line therapy or reduction in the duration of treatment beyond 6 months. So, people have tried their various means with using quinolones, using uh, aminoglycosides to reduce to 3 months to 4 months, but still there is no headway in treatment of tuberculosis shorter than 6 months. You must understand that, that this is very, very difficult to uh, accept by most of the patient and you must tell them this is important. So, what are the various drugs which we use commonly? Isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, streptomycin, ethambutol, or short form uh, HRZSE or SHRZE, whatever you may call it. And if you see, they have very good bactericidal activity and sterilizing activity. What do you mean by bactericidal? You immediately convert the patient to sputum negative, and sterilization is you maintain that negativity or you get rid of persisters and to prevent relapse and treatment failures. And the best drugs are rifampicin and pyrazinamide as a ongoing and isoniazid as force stands both phase. So, combination of four drugs given for two months either intermittently or daily followed by two drugs, four months is the standard regime practice all over the world by all practitioners including the national tuberculosis program and the DOS strategy. So, this is what the basic crux of the program is that you have four drugs daily for two months followed by four months or you have three times a week these four drugs and three times a week these two drugs in the follow up phase. Now, the only drawback here is it is a directly observed therapy. So, if the patient opts for a private practitioner treatment, then whether you would go for a DOTS yourself or you will send him to a DOT center or you go for a daily self administered therapy. That is you must take into account and you must counsel the patient to take the treatment regularly. If he has any problem contact you immediately or report to your center and see what is wrong with the patient. Why is he not taking the treatment? Because missing a dose may be not consequential, but missing your follow up is most important than whether you are, the patient is taking treatment and he falsifies after coming to you that he has taken treatment it stands between good and bad response that is very, very important. So, basic treatment regimes based on these principles are category 1, 2 and 3 and 4 and category 1 as I mentioned is uh, uh, either daily regime self administered or this is the DOTS regime that is 2 months of HRZD th uh, th uh, thrice in a week or basically 4 times in a week followed by 4 uh, or 6 months of HR or 6 months of HE in conditions where you can possibly not get rifampicin, not applicable no longer, we just do not believe that you can give HE alone. And category 2 is basically relapse or treatment failure, you have 2 months of adding streptomycin followed by 1 month of 4 drugs and followed by 5 months of 3 drugs. And now this is basically a very short diagram showing what you do, but nowadays it is recommended by WHO and the national programs that any of these subsets or even here if you suspect that patient could be having a primary drug resistance that is he could have acquired a drug resistant tuberculosis that is if he is living in a contact with a drug resistant TB patient, if he is malnourished then you must get a HIV done if he is diabetic and all these patients must get a direct drug sput uh, sputum examination done and if possible subject to a drug susceptibility at the beginning to determine whether it is a INH or a rifampicin resistance. Dr. Shalab is going to dwell upon that more, but let me tell you, we have a test which is going to dwell more upon that and if it is rifampicin resistance which gives you a result in 2 days, then your first line therapy with is going to fail and rifampicin resistance is taken as a surrogate marker for INH resistance because we have a very, very high INH resistance in India. So, if you have a rifampicin resistance, we consider that possibly the patient is multi drug resistant and then this regime would become a failure. 
without you or me knowing that the patient is already receiving a bad regime and will continue to do so and then go on to a regime will be totally useless because continuation phase you are only going to give rifampicin and INH. So that is the important of isolating a sputum positive case who is possibly drug resistance at the outset. Of course, if he is sensitive, do not worry, he is going to get cured 98 percent, that is important. And what are the doses? The doses are the most important thing to understand. The doses are usually in the daily regime, INS 600, uh, 300 milligram, rifampicin maximum 600 milligram. Of course, the dividing line is between any people take, some people take 60 kg, some people take 54 kg, that you can decide. Pyrazinamide is 1500 milligram to 2000 milligram, ethambutol is 1200 milligram to 1600 milligram. Here, people usually, for, you know, we as practitioner may default because the standard combination contain only 800 milligram ethambutol. So, if you were to prescribe a standard combination, you must add 400 milligram of ethambutol or individualize various uh, capsules and tablets to achieve the drug dosing which is very, very apt and correct for the patient weight. And if patient switches into a next weight category that is beyond 5 kg of weight gain, you must increase the weight uh, uh, appropriate doses even during the therapy. If you do not do so, again you are failing in treatment, that is very important. And if you see the 3 times a week regime, the doses are little higher for INH, parazinamide and ethambutol and you must stick to appropriate doses. Some advices, do not ever add a single drug to a failing regime or you think the patient has not responded by a fever, symptomatic treatment or uh, 14 days there is no improvement in x-ray or if you think that sputum is still continuing to be positive. Do not use quinolones as add-on or single agents or even as a combination therapy instead of pyrazinamide or instead of streptomycin. So, make a combination of levofloxacin, oblique ciprofloxacin, oblique moxifloxacin with INH rifampicin ethambutol. That is absolutely not advisable and not acceptable by any given standard. So, do not, do not add any quinolone. Do not use proton pump inhibitors to add with the rifampicin, that is very, very important. You are going to delay and decrease the absorption of rifampicin. Just for the fear that the patient is probably going to have gastritis or vomiting, you add a PPI in the beginning in the morning and then he takes a rifampicin doses, it is not advisable. Do not use high dose peridoxin to counteract effects of INH peripheral neuropathy. 10 milligram is the accepted dose do not use 40 milligram which is commercially available. We do have a 10 milligram tablet of pyridoxine available in the market, must try and find it out and use that. Because if you use high dose pyridoxine, you are counteracting the effect of INH because it is weight to weight discounting. If you have 100 milligram pyridoxine, it is going to discount 100 milligram of isoniazid. That is very, very important. You must think about that. Then must do sputum susceptibility as I mentioned, do not do serology and do not do nuclear acid amplification test or start ATT based on PCR or interferon gamma related assays. That is very, very important. This is what is the main crux of WHO statement, the national tuberculosis control program statement. Do not base your diagnosis on serology, only try to base your uh, diagnosis on sputum and or x-ray uh, treatment, uh, x-ray diagnosis. <coughs> Monitoring, usually you monitor at <coughs> intensive phase the sputum examination and you may obtain 4 months if the sputum, if you think the patient may be sputum positive and assess for failure at 6 months. If you cannot do and the patient feels that he is fine and you feel the patient has completed treatment, then he is definitely cured at 6 months. So, by doing this, what happens? You are probably uh, achieve 98 percent sputum negative at the end of 6 months, 0.8 percent may remain sputum positive and about 1.2 percent would have died, but still you have achieved 98 percent cure for a very important disease and that is the effect of good chemotherapy. But if you have no chemotherapy, 50 percent would die and there will be 18 percent sputum positive at the end of 6 months. And if it is a poor chemotherapy either by combination or by poor drug dosing, then still about 20 percent will remain you know sputum positive. That is a bad chemotherapy on any part. So, coming to the next set, we discuss some of it later on also. Extra pulmonary tuberculosis, that is a big thing because we see as a private practitioners whole lot of extra pulmonary tuberculosis and uh, uh, it constitutes about 15 to 20 percent of TB patients 
and 50% are TB patients and immunosuppressed patients and multiple sites would be involved, lymph nodes, pleural effusion and others. Signs and symptoms are very non-specific, diagnosis is often delayed, atypical clinical presentation, no pathognomic findings or signs for any site except for lymph nodes. You may have extra lymph node bulges in the uh, neck or you may have a CSF tuberculosis, you may have ascites, peritoneal tuberculosis or you may have diarrhea alternating with constipation or subacute and obstruction for abdominal tuberculosis. Tissue samples are often difficult and more so for drug sensitivity to begin with. So, if you have these kind of subsets or if you have patients coughing up blood, increasing breathlessness, sudden increasing chest pain, deteriorating general condition must refer them to a specialized center. And all these patients are suspect except primary tuberculosis, TB meningitis, renal tuberculosis, spinal TB or disseminated tuberculosis must be referred to a specialist or a specialized hospital and do not take initiative in treating these patients because they are potential reasons or potential patients who would fail because of incorrect diagnosis or delay in diagnosis. In general, extra pulmonary tuberculosis as per literature can be treated in the same way, but many of us as practitioners may think otherwise. That is not to be thought because still it can be treated as same except in meningeal bone and joint tuberculosis and special cases of you know immune reconstitution or extra pulmonary tuberculosis of lymph node where you need to add or continue treatment for a while. Corticosteroids may be useful. So, if you were to give a tabular form to this, usually only CNS tuberculosis or some patient of bone and joint, you may require an extended treatment, except all other patients would require the standard six months treatment. Corticosteroids only for pericarditis and CNS tuberculosis, none for any other thing. Some people still use pleural effusion. We also use at times when there is a large pleural effusion of the patient is symptomatic to prevent a thickening or to have a rapid resolution of pleural effusion, but still not recommended by the literature. So, we will just summarize that into a two or three short questions. A 20 year old woman is taking standard four drugs treatment TB for five weeks, now complains of nausea, vomiting, pain and she has ictus and right upper coronary tenderness. Her urine is dark colored. What is the appropriate action? Would you stop all drugs? Would you stop isoniazid alone or you give pyridoxin or replace pyrazinamide streptomycin? So, as per if you go by the guidelines, none of the answers is correct because you possibly cannot substitute replace pyrazinamide streptomycin. That is a bad practice adding a new drug because just thinking that probably pyrazinamide has caused the drug induced hepatitis. So, you would select the most offending agent that is probably pyrazinamide, rifampicin and maybe INH and you will withdraw them, replace or if you still feel the patient is needing some form of continuation of ATT, you will substitute with streptomycin ethambutol. Do not still add quinolone, that is a wrong practice. Use streptomycin. Yeah. Exactly, that is that is why. So, if you that is why I said stop all drugs would be most appropriate, but certain cases if you still want to continue. Exactly. So, but these is more why I place these do not do this, that is important, that is very, very important. Thanks for raising that, thank you very much. So, similarly, a second question a woman who comes from far cannot be followed up, and what would be initial choice? A true drug regime or for first two months a three drug regime, you are afraid that you may give a parazinamide to this old lady and she may not turn up with side effects and they may not turn up here or a fixed dose combination for nine months or a fixed dose combination first two months followed by IRH rifampicin. So, I think this is what is most appropriate because this is the standard practice. Why deviate from any practice? So, do not let your deviations come to your mind, stick to one single practice. And as we mentioned extra pulmonary tuberculosis, all of them can be treated with standard therapy and do not require a longer duration except for uh, CNS and bone and joint tuberculosis. Now, this is a beautiful slide. What happens as I mentioned if you do not do a sensitivity test? If you have started with INH, rifampicin and ethambutol and if the patient was a resistance to INH the probably this regime is ineffective and you are giving only true drugs. If it was resistance to INH and rifampicin, then this is ineffective again. 
But if the patient develops an acquired resistance to rifampicin, this becomes absolutely useless. If it becomes, he requires a thumbutol resistance, this is absolutely useless at the nine months. So you must consider in a given patient, considering that could be a uh, case for drug susceptibility testing. That's important. So having said that about the standard treatment, we move on to a new era of uh, drug resistant uh, tuberculosis or a XDR TB and that is the most important. We'll discuss this in detail. Why? These were manageable by DOTS. We had in 1990 MDR or drug resistant tuberculosis to INH and uh, rifampicin. We had XDR TB where it was in addition to INH rifampicin resistance to one of the quinolones and also to second line injectables except for streptomycin, either canamycin, amikacin or capromycin. And now we have a total drug resistance or extreme drug resistance. None of the drugs are effective for any form of this tuberculosis. It continues to be smear positive and that is the biggest thing that this is a man-made problem or patient-made problem or doctor-made problem or ineffective management problem, whatever you may call it. Poor adherence, poor quality of drugs, poor supply of drugs, poor compliance or poor follow-up. And we ourselves are to blame and we should not have had let this happen. And you see this, 1990 where first cases of MDR-TB started to rise. And if you go back to my historical perspective, that is when the all over the world, including WHO, thought again and again that we are working at only 10% of treatment level or cure level of program conditions and we must take immediate action to revise the strategy, go for a DOTS and absolutely immaculate follow-up. Then only we can prevent drug resistant tuberculosis, but still we do have a lot of cases. So we have seen these causes and the MDR-TB is basically rifampicin either with or without resistance to other drugs. Single isonese rifampicin is not MDR, it is only drug resistant TB and it is a laboratory diagnosis. So do not label on clinical grounds of a poor response patient has MDR and as a knee jerk reaction add a quinolone or add aminoglycoside. That is the biggest or the worst practice ever to be followed because what you would do without knowing you may cause inappropriate use of these drugs causing them to become resistant. And mind you nowadays ciprofloxacin is practically out. We do not use as a second line or a retreatment regime. Usually we use moxifloxacin or levofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin has a cross resistance to a floxacin. So if you are to use a ciprofloxacin probably or your offofloxacin, you are causing absolutely inappropriate therapy. So again, desist from adding any quinolone or any amino glycoside for a failing or thought to be failing regime or thought to be a poorly responsive patient. You must look at the causes. He may be just not responsive due to various simple causes like debility or diabetes or maybe his immune status is going down, he is not adequately nutrition, you know, uh, taking nutrition. So all those things must be considered and it is not that you just label him as MDR and then you should have an appropriate sample to get an MDR diagnosis which will take about at least four weeks, two to four weeks. Do we, we do have good uh, DST testing and immediately which may take about seven days but still it is far from a uh, uh, usual routine because the normal labs may do it which may be false. We will see how it is false than the national laboratory. And so based on this data, patients were being seen in 2006, WHO and the US Center for Disease Control that is CDC Atlanta, they floated a definition of XDR whereby you have INH and rifampicin resistance added to a fluoroquinicol resistance or one of the three injectable aminoglycoside resistance. But possibly they would be responsive to ethambutol, parazinamide, uh, 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 basically uh, streptomycin, cyclosirine, ethambutamide and PAS. And this has been seen all across more than 50 countries or 55 countries now. Uh, uh, this is the global burden of XDR TB uh, uh, that is uh, accounts for 5 percent of 9 million cases of new TB and it has been reported practically everywhere. And this is the most discussed article in the world literature when XDR TB came into focus in a South African uh, population. Most of them were infested with HIV. Most important fact was 55 percent of these patients had never received anti TB drugs in the past. And it was suggested that probably it was a primary transmission of 
XDR pathogen. Probably they were living in association with patients who already had an XDR TB. And mind you, these patients maximum mortality was in you know initial phases and many of the patients died within 16 days of diagnosing of XDR. So, the burden was huge and we have our own share. The first case in India was reported in 2007 from Lucknow and since then of course, we see a lot of XDR cases. And the global estimates are there are more than 16,000 label cases uh, sorry 27,000 label cases of XDR TB and these are only diagnosed. If you see at one third which are not diagnosed, this could well make up to about 35,000 cases of XDR which are spreading the disease. So, if we see can XDR TB be cured? Yes, in some cases the overall response is about 30 percent patients and the response is usually similar to XDR and MDR depends on the severity of disease immune response and we must have an access to good laboratory like Dr. Lal Path Lab or associated national reference laboratories where we can have drug susceptibility testing or drugs should be available to offer to the uh, patient. We will see how we make a regimen for XDR or MDR TB which is so difficult. So, the principle is what are the available drugs and there are certain guidelines we must follow what is the duration of treatment, how do we monitor and is surgery indication. So, it has been categorized uh, into five different groups of drugs which have to be selected. The first line drug that is HRZE, the second line drugs are all injectables streptomycin, canamycin, amikacin, captomycin. These are included as second line, but the definition reads that it could be resistant to either of the last three aminoglycosides. So, you have to choose which is not resistant and there is a cross resistance here between canamycin and amikacin or fluoroquinolone, moxifloxacin and levofloxacin, ofloxacin, cipro or gadifloxacin, cipro and oflox are usually out because of high degree of resistance and up to this three level, these are good bactericidal drugs. So, if you have a good combination which can be out of these four new drugs, you are best able to do it. But then if you have to add these drugs like ethanomide, prothenomide, cyclosidin, terizodone or pass you can land into trouble because these are poorly tolerated drugs and they are not so efficacious. And then we have a last group where poorly documented or unclear efficacy where you have uh, basically clofazamine, amoxclav, linezoloid, imipenem, silasticin, thiacetazone, clarithromycin or high dose INH. Other drugs are being evaluated and we have new drug called badiculine, but that is not available in India, WHO has approved that. And the doses are you have to use very, very appropriate doses. So, we just discussed shortly a case study. Uh, this is picked up from the net from the USAID Center of Stop TB program. This is a case 60 year old 1986 diagnosed with positive uh, uh, skin test and abnormal x ray and we have a sputum positive culture was sensitive to all drugs. Patient given with ATT self administered patient non uh, very regular alcohol abuse uncooperative stop parazinamide ethambutol on his own and after 6 months still AFB positive, somebody added ethambutol. Again a wrong decision to make and after about uh, uh, you can say 10 months patient continues to be sputum positive and patient was discontinued on INH rifampicin because it was thought there is drug resistance and we started pyrazinamide, streptomycin and continued ethambutol. So, this is what happens when you do not know and this is a uh, uh, imagine the year, this is 1987. So, when the drug resistant pattern was not known, the possibility of new drugs was not known and how to combine drugs was not known, but still we have this kind of a situation in our country with many of the patients and many of the practitioners. What happens next? Patient continued loss for follow up for 10 years, he is now 73 years of old, he continues to be sputum positive and he was again restarted on standard therapy pending drug sensitivity results because now drug sensitivity is available after initial diagnosis 13 years later. He continues with treatment and the drug sensitivity comes from a normal lab not a certified lab and it is resistant to INH rifampicin, canamycin, amikacin, ciprofloxacin, ethamide. So, it is an XDR TB. Now, what these people do? He is stopped on INH rifampicin, is continued with ethambutol, parazinamide, streptomycin is added good, ofloxacin is added. We mentioned that cipro and ofloxacin cross resistance. So, he should not have been added with ofloxacin. Clofazamine is added from the group 5 drugs 
unclear efficacy. So, it is an ineffective regime only three drugs coming back to original. So, here we have faulted and this is continued for 13 months patient became negative and patient was thought that probably is cured he was discontinued, but the sputum sample which was sent a week earlier again came to be positive. So, he continues to be XDR. Now, a national reference laboratory test gives you what diagnosis again same resistance but added is ofloxacin and intermediate resistance to clarithromycin these are still susceptible. So, a new regime is formulated ethambutol, pyrazinamide continued, clofazamine continued, cycloserine, rifabutin and levofloxacin. Unfortunately, patient is too sick and patient dies after 4 months of treatment. So, what happens? In 14 years, we made the patient run away, we have probably made more people infected in the community with the sputum positive persister and probably in the last one and a half years, he was XDR and probably infected more than whatever patients he could have, one, four to five people minimum in his surroundings and maybe more and he died. So, absolutely failure of any given treatment protocol in this particular patient. So, it is important that we must not, you know, mingle regime. So, we must follow basic principles. I will just come to that. Four drugs usually used, highly effective depending on following factors, drug sensitivity testing, no previous history of treatment failure no known close, uh, close contacts with resistance. Drug resistance survey indicates resistance is rare in this similar patient. So, you can use these four drugs and these are not commonly used by various practitioners in this area. So, you can still rely on these drugs. So, as I mentioned cross resistance should be looked into with fluoroquinolones, rifampicines and aminoglycosides and as we said use 1 to 5 group, first group any first line drugs which are effective and sensitive like ethambutol and pyrazinamide was sensitive and effective, aminoglycoside, use a fluoroquinolone, preferably moxifloxacin and any other two complement basically make up about 5 to 7 drugs to at least think that 4 are effective. Imagine the burden of drugs to a given patient which is going to take with so difficulty of tolerating these drugs. So, once again we come to this group and we have to combine either two or three whatever is resist uh, sensitive may be two only and one here, one here at least and one here. So, it will be two, three, four, five. If you still think that the patient may not respond and may become resistant with acquired drug resistance to quinolones, you may add one or two here that is important. So, this could be a regime, six to nine months of injectable canamycin, ofloxin, ethanomide, cyclosine parazinamide, ethimetol, 18 months of ofloxacin, ethanomide, cycloserine and ethimetol. Huge burden, huge follow up needed, huge potential for patient dropping out and not completing the full course, continue to be a case of XDR in the community. Total duration is 24 months. Now, this is a category 5 regime and this is basically from extreme drug resistance where you do not know what to do. You can combine anything on the earth, whatever you like and it is 7 drugs with 2 reserve drugs, again intensive phase for 6 to 12 months rather than the 6 to 9 months, continuation phase for 18 months, so it could be 24 to 30 months that is 2 years to 3 years. Very sad story, but we do occasionally see such patients. So, TB is not gone away, TB remains high, is highly preventable and transmissible, anyone can get tuberculosis not only poor people minorities or foreign war, TB anywhere is TB everywhere. All resistant TBs, MDR extensive drug resistance are preventable for proper treatment. And you do not want to be sitting in a plane or a bus for 8 hours or maybe long drive next to an untreated coughing person with any kind of TB, be it be drug sensitive XDR and MDR. There have been outbreaks which have been reported in literature by traveling person with sputum positive patient with MDR TB in an aeroplane and infecting at least 30 people and out of that 10 percent people in developing disease due to a MDR TB pathogen. So, it is very, very important. I will just skip through uh, the slides, I will just mention renal insufficiency is a big, you know, difficult game to handle. Nephrologists want the drugs to go down, we want the drug doses to maintain. So, if you were to see a patient, you must follow certain schedules. The ethambutol continues to be same contrary to belief. 
of course, all injectable aminoglycosides go down as per the creatinine clearance goes down. The paracinamide extreme cases may go down, but remain the same. And if you have rifampicin, INH, only the INH goes down, not the rifampicin. So this is a big, you know, divide between physicians and nephrologists. They always want to decrease the drugs, but if you decrease, you may not have a good efficacy. So you must follow strictly the doses guidelines and the weight adjusted guidelines. So this is a big chart on adverse drug reactions. Uh, we all know the most important is drug induced hepatitis. We already had a brief mention of that, and we just go through that uh, because the time is short. We want more. Uh, yeah, so it's uncommon in children, and symptoms are of course we see that. And important is INH rifampicin is more than INH alone. That is the standard regime. That is more than paracinamide alone and rifampicin and you know, ethanomide. But we all usually tend to discontinue paracinamide, INH, and rifampicin, restart the drugs. And uh, all patients who have uh, uh, liver disease should not be given ethanomide or prothenomide, that is very, very important. So, hold the drugs, LFT is normal, we can uh, restart. Arthralgia is a big challenge nowadays. The causative agents are paracinamide, maybe ethimbutol and INH arthralgia on, only and quinolones. Quinolones can cause tendinitis, but not true arthralgias. So, we must be aware and but may need discontinuation of drug. These are of course, uh, special situations. This is important. Occasional patient may develop seizures and they are due to cyclosyrene, INH and fluoroquinolone and we must initiate anticonvulsant therapy and increase pyridoxine to a maximum dose of 200 milligram day if you suspect the INH or cyclosyrene as the causative agent for seizures and that will prevent seizures in a given patient. These are again very important. Some patients of hypothyroidism may come up with treatment with ethinomide and prothenomide. You may, we, I had a patient who developed hypothyroidism the tune of TSH going up to 240 and we could only realize late that this was probably a side effect of ethinomide and we can have electrolyte disturbances. Now, this is very, very important immune reconstitution syndrome that you have a patient and suddenly if the lymph nodes are being treated after 3 to 12 weeks of treatment uh, due to a uh, probably an immune suppression or whatever we call it immune uh, focal immune response. There is a recruitment of lymphocytes and macrophages at these sites and there is enlargement of these lesions. The patient's lymph nodes suddenly big bigger they suppurate or they appear at the next side, they may axilla, they may appear at the groin or their new lesions may appear, plural effusion on one side, the other side it appears or these are basically hypersensitivity to tubercular proteins and should be dealt with either treatment with steroids or just wait and watch or drain these sites if they are causing purulent discharges or rapid collection of fluid and usually require no change in treatment and do not confuse them with extra pulmonary tuberculosis of drug resistance type. That is very, very important. Again, knee jerk reaction, you add a quinolone or add a streptomycin or add amikacin, that is not good. Now, do we have time? We should take questions. So, we just, uh, as, as, uh, end up by saying that we have a very big responsibility in our head to stop TB and save the world and basically look for the lost cases of tuberculosis in our community and treat them adequately with good regime and thinking uh, that the patient needs a final cure, whether he is in a private sector, in a government sector, need not to send him to government if he is not willing for taking treatment and revised national program. We can use a non-supervised daily chemotherapy, follow him very adequately and uh, basically treat him to cure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Animesh, for such a conclusive lecture. We have few questions. Yeah. From Silachar and from Jhansi, we have questions. TB ferron is high in TB, and so is it for other chronic infections. So how conclusive it is to detect the TB? And the other question is also for TB interferon gamma. What are the exact indications to propose for TB goal? Your opinions. Uh, TB, as I mentioned, the TB interferon or interferon gamma related assays. Uh, in a country of high prevalence as in India, 
are equated as good as tuberculin skin testing. So, if we have to only think of a latent tuberculosis infection, where it is a matter of life and death and we are considering that if the patient could possibly have a disseminated tuberculosis and you cannot withhold the treatment and if you want to do a IGRA assay, then if it is positive, you may consider treatment, but it has no more value than tuberculin skin testing. And even WHO has not recommended and uh, of course, there are special situations. I think Dr. Shalab would probably be more appropriate to answer this question. If we have more treatment related question, I will be more welcoming to answer. Treatment, treatment related, the there is a question here. from Dr. Saloni. She is asking, should anti-TB therapy be started if a patient has only granulomatous lymphatitis on FNAC, but the smear is negative and PCR is also negative? So how should we go ahead yeah, with that? Very important question. Uh, basically, uh, pathologist says on FNAC of the lymph node of the neck or any visible lymph node, there is a granulomatous adenitis and uh, he or she has scanned the uh, slides and the, uh, it is negative for A or B stain. What do you do? Do you consider it to be a uh, uh, tuberculosis or a granulomatous adenitis which can have causes like sarcoidosis or it could be occasionally a lymphoma, a very rarely a foreign body lymphoma or a chronic granulomatous adenitis non-specific. Now, just to mention the time uh, frame of this uh, granulomatous adenitis which is not characteristic, it has been seen that about 40 percent of these patients who report first as granulomatous adenitis in the FNAC not conclusive TB either by non uh, uh, that is caseating granulomas or AFB positive would develop over a three month period time a frank tubercular adenitis. So, still have a chance of 40 percent becoming positive for tuberculosis in the time course of the disease. Now, if you have a corresponding tuberculin skin testing that is MAN2 test which is highly positive that is more than 15 or 16 as per our uh, country that is in duration, then you must consider it to be a positive for tuberculosis and must treat. And if you have an associated pulmonary tuberculosis making it a disseminated tuberculosis, you must treat as pulmonary tuberculosis or EPT combined. Occasionally, if you are very, very strong in suspicion, then you should subject it to a full biopsy or a repeat sample first and at least do a gene expert test in the aspirate to get a highly uh, positive sample even picking up bacteria. And it depends on the staining. If you are doing a oromine stain, that is more appropriate than a simple stain because you have 80 percent versus 95 percent or 97 percent positivity rate with oramin stain than a conventional stain. So, my algorithm would be wait and watch if no symptoms, you treat adequately with antibiotic and preferably repeat FNAC not from the same site, maybe from a different site and if still you are suspecting go for a uh, biopsy and even then you can suspect to AB stain subject to an culture and then decide. Sir, I have one question. Many a times we come across a patient who has had convulsions for the first time and on um, doing MRI we find query tuberculoma, query NC, uh, NCC. So, and patient does not have any other uh, stigma of tuberculosis how, and uh, even LP is uh, normal. So, how to uh, progress in such a case? I think it is a very difficult question. Even neurologists uh, would tend to, you know, uh, be may favoring either both things or maybe framing alone a healed tuberculoma versus an active neurocystic sarcosis or maybe it is a healed both the things and treat nothing, just treat the convulsion part. Now, uh, in CNS tuberculosis, you have three different uh, subsets of uh, people. Either you have a TB meningitis which is frank, which will be obvious or you have a tubercular encephalopathy where is a sub epidural focus or a sub dural focus that discharges contents into the CSF and it is behaving like a simple enteric encephalopathy, but you find a xanthochromia or high protein in the uh, CSF. Still, you have to watch these patients and for tubercloma, I think either you do a or a neurocystic sarcosis, you do a spectro uh, uh, you know, uh, scopy of the MRI, MRI spe uh, spectroscopy and they have a distinctive uh, bandwidth where they can say this is neurocystic sarcosis active or non-active and whether that could be the cause of uh, convulsions and they can define whether it is a neurocystic because you usually do not have two things together. 
it would be possibly a neurocystic sarcosis and a healed granuloma. Yeah. So, you do not have so, to he treat, yeah. treat healed and granuloma. I have one more question. Uh, many times, sir, we are facing patients who we just started on ETT and they developed hepatotoxicity. Yes. Uh, then, sir, how do you progress in that case? What is the... Uh, and secondly, uh, once you, like what I do, I withdraw all the drugs and only let the patient go with uh, this INH and um, I add uh, streptomycin. Um, and sometimes pass and then uh, over period of time I let the um, uh, enzymes come back to normal. Once they are normal, I institute one drug at a time and then wait for five to seven days and again repeat uh, LFT and then institute a second drug and third drug like that we are going. But uh, uh, first question is this that how do you uh, approach such a case? Second question is this, will the duration of the treatment be extended because we have lagged in time for that particular treatment? So, uh, first of all, to mention there is a protocol in WHO, a guideline for national tuberculosis program for treating hepatotoxicity and you can go through that guideline and they, uh, of course, we said that the uh, various drugs which are most uh, hepatotoxic are pyrazinamide or INH and rifampicin combination. So, invariably all people who develop hepatotoxicity will develop within 7 to 10 days or up to 14 days. Usually hepatotoxicity or any raised hepatic enzymes or any jaundice which develops after two weeks is not usually related to hepatotoxicity. So, we must define what is hepatotoxicity. Either it is a symptomatic GI disturbance along with hepatitis that is more than two and a half times raised enzymes that is more than 100 usually cases of more so SGPT than SGOT alone is quite sufficient. Even that is sufficient to follow up. The first and foremost practice would be to withdraw all drugs to improve upon gastritis, we are not talking of anything else. At least let the gentleman take his regular routine diet, that is very, very important. As the patient comes back to normal diet, you should start a lowest offending agent, it could be INH and you start on 50 or 100 milligram, you can do 50 in the morning and see after 4 hours a SGPT, if it is okay, you can go to 100 and then straight away go to 300. Some people from 50, they can go to 300. And then you continue to for 3 days, add rifampicin, maybe 100 milligram, go to 300, go to 450 in 12 hour period, monitor enzymes. Now, what you said about adding streptomycin and pass is a not a good practice. Why? How would you justify discontinuing streptomycin after 7 or 10 days, number 1? And would you like to continue streptomycin for 60 days, adding a regime which is fresh in its totality from beginning of start of streptomycin? So, the previous thing is discounted. So, would you then consider a four drug regime of streptomycin, INH, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, rifampicin or if you are not able to give either of these drugs, then it would be a regime of streptomycin, INH, ethambutol or streptomycin, INH and pass. So, we go back to the golden era days where there were only three drugs, two, two for two months and ten uh, for ten months only INH and ethambutol. So, either we then stick to that principle and have a suboptimal cure rate of only 67 to 80 percent or you stop everything, wait for everything to recover, introduce very fast as per protocol and usually it is seen all these patients would re-tolerate drugs except barring some patients may be less than 0.1 percent. The development of hepatotoxicity, the uh, incidence is about uh, 3 percent, 1 to 3 percent. The fatality rate is also there, you can have a fatal hepatitis. We have had two patients so far in my career, young uh, girls who have died of hepatitis and we just could not do acute severe fulminant hepatic failure. So, we should be aware of that, but in my opinion and with the world literature, do not add streptomycin and pass unless there is a cause to think that the patient may not, you know, may deteriorate for want of chemotherapy. Because Ah, they, they see, they, 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 very special situations. Yeah. See, and he is having lot of hemoptysis, then should we be waiting for the person's enzymes to come back to normal or at the same time institute something at least? Exactly. So, if you have a life threatening situation, then we must add an alternative regime or make an alternative regime, but be sure to continue that. Yeah. Uh, that. yeah. So, do not discount. People do as a streptomycin is added no, and if the example is added, then streptomycin discontinued after 15 days, uh, you can't do that. Yeah, exactly. That's important. That's very, very important. 
Sir, we are giving the DOS treatment as well as the uh, daily treatment. Yes. Do we have any difference in the efficacy and the duration of the treatment? A very good question. We have been debating this in last conference in NatCon 2013, and a uh, uh, lot of experts, including our dear friend Dr. Rupak Singla, who is the national coordinator for RNTCP, he says there is no literature support in the world to suggest that the daily intensive phase regime is any day better than the intermittent regime. So this is a basically, and this is now incorporated in the standard uh, treatment care guidelines even, that daily regime is no better. But if you go on the other hand, see the records and see the profiling of the patient who present with TB, 50% and more, 60% of patients are presenting to us as private healthcare providers, either in the hospitals or in dispensaries or in our clinics. Would you be able to carry forward an intermittent regime in a given patient with strict follow-up? Would you be able to get that supply of RNTCP uh, regime at your clinic? There is a protocol. If you are seeing a good number of patients, you can request the total TB officer to make you as a part of a DOTS program strategy. You could be given drugs, but you will have to monitor. You could be even compensated by money. That is up to 40,000 rupees a year. But are you willing to take the responsibility? Are you able to follow that? But there is no literature support to say that daily regime is any day better. But because of program conditions, because of inability to reach, inability of the common masses to come to the RNTCP or the government institutions, daily regime would be a preferred regime for all of us and in interest of the patient to prevent at least a relapse. And at least we can have a recall. We can keep informing the patient, keep emphasizing to him either by telephonic call or asking him to come, at least show his face every 7 days, 14 days or 1 and a half months, whatever time you choose that if he is taking the drugs or not. And mind you, most of the patients now are well educated by tuberculosis. They are sincere to take tuberculosis treatment. They do not want preferentially to go to a government setup because of delay, because of time consumption and probably the attitude. That's more important. Sir, is there any difference if we are giving the, uh, every antitubular drug separately or in combination? Sorry? The kits of the uh, antitubular drugs are being available. So it, is it give any difference in the treatment if you give the uh, drug separately okay. as the a single kits, drug yeah, or yeah. in the combination? See, that is why the confusion is already started. If you see the dosing regimes are very, very well defined. There is no change in doses in last 35 years. Nobody has changed the doses. Only WHO came up with a different profiling below 34 kgs between 35 kgs, 35 to 54 kgs and 54 kgs and above. But there is a ceiling of what you can give with pyrazinamide. There is a ceiling of what you can give with ethambutol and uh, rifampicin. American Thoracic Society decides that if there are 75 kgs and above, you can go to 900 milligrams of rifampicin. You can go up to 2.5 grams of pyrazinamide, but you cannot increase on ethambutol. So all the kit formulation, unfortunately, who decided when and what? How the drug controller general decided whether ethambutol should be 800 milligram based on what basis? All patients should be given at least 25 milligram or at least 20 milligram of ethambutol. And average weight is not 40 kgs, it is more than 45 kgs. So we are again faltering. So if you are giving a, a combination, you have to add in ethambutol. Or if you are giving a so it is best to individualize. If your patient fits into the category of 35 to 54 kgs, or best, less than 35, I think it's best suited below 40 kgs. It's very good suited. So if you have somebody 42, 45 kgs, you can give a kit. If it is not, then you should individualize. Uh, sir, uh, we are treating uh, about 3,000 patients in Mulana Medical College who are having uh, HIV AIDS. <coughs> TB in AIDS is uh, more common. Yes. Uh, 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 nearly 60% of AIDS yeah. patients have TB. And it's very difficult to treat TB in AIDS patients because they have various complications and MDR is very common. Yeah. When you recommend uh, sensitivity testing in MDR in AIDS patient, what we found that these patients who are already have low albumin, they are having hepatitis, they are alcoholic and they are more prone to have drug induced hepatitis. So whenever there is a clinical suspicion of any tubercular lesion in an HIV positive patient, then you must do the uh, site specific sampling and you must do drug sensitivity at the day uh, one you know you must put the Heinz test immediately because uh, particularly gene expert which is more so for sputum and bronchioliver lavage not so much so for plural fluid or CSF or acidic fluid so but still people are using it is recommended with a low grade of recommendation 
Number one. No, but uh, this uh, report came very late and we can't. No, uh, if you do the, the gene expert, it comes within two or three days. No. At least the INH and no, Revampage. It's not and available research. in most of the government setup. No, government setup, that's why we have seven to nine reference laboratories in Delhi, which are charging a special rate, about 1700 rupees for gene expert, which is a WHO prescribed rate and nobody can charge more than that. And it has to be a good quality sputum or a sample. You can even send a pleural fluid. We have had pleural fluid positive patients, but then it should be done. If you do not do it, on, and simultaneously, <coughs> what my advice is simultaneously send a routine culture and sensitivity, at least. Because the results should be available by three to four weeks or at least six weeks of time. And start a standard regime anti tubercular based on the CD4 count. Start anti retroviral therapy between two and eight weeks of therapy. But the only drawback of starting. Early ART is immune reconstitution syndrome. They come up with increased flare up of existing lesions. That's the biggest drawback. We'll take up the queries later on. Yeah, sure. After the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. To come to a final conclusion for the diagnosis of TB and its management, we should have specific and reliable tests for the detection of tuberculosis, which gives us a prompt and correct diagnosis. I would invite upon Dr. Shalab Malik, HOD Microbiology from Dr. Lalpath Labs. He has been in association with us since 2010, and alumni of Sion, Mumbai, and prior to this, he has worked in various institutes and labs like Quest Diagnostics, Sri Action Biology, and Mata Chanan Devi, New Delhi. He'll be discussing about the algorithm of TB diagnosis from the basic X-ray examination to the latest Heinz essay, all the microbiological investigations, including the standard, gold standard culture, will be a part of his presentation. We hope this lecture elucidates upon us the battery of tests to be ordered and the efficacies and FAQs for these tests. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ratima, for a very kind introduction. Thank you. Sir. And very good noon to all of you. I will be speaking about the diagnostic algorithm and various possibilities available in 2014. So, uh, Dr. Arya has already highlighted uh, what is the TB burden in India today. And I will just reiterate it that we are 20 percent contributor or uh, in other words, every one, uh, fifth, ca every, uh, one, fifth case, one in five case is Indian. So, estimated incidence. 2 million new cases annually and mortality is around 3 lakh 30 thousand deaths due to TB each year. Every sixth case of tuberculosis dies. But irony of the situation is 80 percent of the time we are using radiology as a baseline investigation to diagnose tuberculosis and only 20 percent of the time microbiological investigations are asked for. So, there is a big gap in this. And now, what are the best diagnostic practices and what are the best internationally accepted best practices for the diagnosis of tuberculosis? There are only three scenarios. It can be active tuberculosis, it will be for drug resistant tuberculosis or it is for latent tuberculosis infection. So, whenever the physician or a clinician is writing an investigation, these three pillars, he has to keep it in mind, what he is targeting. And each set of tests will be answering according to the situation required. So, based on WHO policies and international standards care, we will be taking our discussion ahead. So, now coming to the hardcore microbiological investigation, which is uh, what I will say the uh, etiological uh, final pointer in this is three options are available in this. One is you see the bugs that is by microscopically or you multiply them that is PCR or nucleic acid based amplification test or you grow them that is by culture based technology. So, let us discuss the first scenario microscopy which is the cheapest test available in India today and this is the test which has got a rapid turnaround time also. 
So, what are, what are the uh, uh, techniques which is available in this is Oramin screen and Gil Nelson screen. So, at Dr. Lal Path Lab, we are following these both dual technologies whenever the sample for microscopy is sent to us. And the sample requirement now as per WHO recommendation is two spot sampling. So, earlier dictum of sending the patient for three subsequent days or consecutive days is no longer true. You have to stick to two spot sample or the first morning sample is they good enough. Otherwise, the patient can come directly to the diagnostic center, give one sample over there on the spot and one sample one hour apart will do good to cleanse the diagnosis. Now, coming to the sample per se, some things have to be kept in mind before ordering uh, or explaining the test to the uh, patient. One is the site specific sample. This is very important. You have to be very target specific. If you are dealing with pulmonary, it is sputum or if you are dealing with some pus or some tissue base, then it has to be that. Volume is very critical. If volume is not justified, if volume is very minuscule, then definitely the investigations will be compromised. And especially if you have a uh, very minuscule volume, then you go for a very target specific investigation rather than ordering a battery of investigation, which will be just documentary formality in that case. Timing as I have already defined first morning sample is gold standard. Otherwise, two spot samples is good enough. Difficult sites, wherever possible, try to access them and get a right sample out. Children, as per the latest standards of care, which Dr. Arya was also mentioning in his talk, which were out on World TB Day, is a gastric lavage or uh, sputum by induced sputum will be the sample of choice as far as children are concerned. Then HIV positive subjects and rewards pulmonary versus extra pulmonary on microscopy also I will cover in this. Now, this is a photograph of now these green things, green bacilli which you are seeing is by fluorescent based microscopy. This is a very sensitive technique and especially boon to us. And this is now one of a uh, pillars in the standards of care in 2014 that LED based microscopy is very sensitive and we do confirm it by our conventional stain that is Zeal Nelson stain where we demonstrate the red bacilli in this. Now problem, problem with this investigation is uh, there has to be minimum 10,000 bacteria per ml to cleanse the diagnosis. Turnaround time is 20 minutes, sensitivity is around 20 to 30 percent and with addition of oramin that by sensitivity improves further by 10 to 15 percent. This investigation is low on sensitivity but high on specificity. Once you are able to see the bacteria, you are certain that you are dealing with a tuberculous bug in this. So, specificity is alright but sensitivity is poor. So, in my lab where I am uh, nearly examining hundreds of slides daily, the detection or positivity rate is around 10 to 12 percent, highly specific investigation and let me show you the further slide. Now, this slide, you see out of the 100 cases, only 10 percent extra pulmonary we were able to demonstrate by microscopically. So, that means this investigation is not good as far as extra pulmonary samples are concerned concerned. In pulmonary cases, it is okay, 90 percent of the positive cases were all pulmonary. So, then coming to the other investigation or which they call as a gold standard investigation also is a TB culture and we are doing it by automated fluorescence based technology and a very common uh, popular system for this type of technique is MGIT by Bechtec. And uh, again, the sample will be very important over here, volume will be also very critical and you have to have site specific sample for whatever microbiological investigations you order. Total protocol will be of 42 days and the reporting pattern will be like two interims based at the interval of two weeks each. 
final report will be given to you on the 42nd day. But what happens if it turns out positive in between? Well, we have a system where we uh, immediately inform you whenever positivity arises. So, immediately on a registered mobile number, the message will flash that your uh, report has come positive and if you want to get the DST done, please contact us within the 15 days because that is the retention period of the positive tube. So, how, uh, uh, what all I am telling you in this? I am giving you a complete information. If the culture comes positive, I am telling you which type of mycobacterium has grown in this, whether you are dealing with mycobacterium tuberculosis or whether you are dealing with non-tuberculosis mycobacteria and which species of non-mycobacteria, non-tuberculous mycobacteria you are dealing with. So, entire capsule is completed in this and these are the uh, battery of uh, sequences which the TB culture tube once declared positive by a machine which is a totally automated platform tells us then these are the steps which are involved. We do microscopy to reconfirm. Then there is a specific antigen based test which is highly specific for tuberculosis and tuberculosis uh, group. And then I have got a state of art equipment called Malditoff. No, the very few installations are there in our country and we at the Dr. Lal Path Lab uh, are very proud to announce that in private sector lab we are the only one which is using this type of technique that is Malditoff that is a protein based analysis. So, this is capable of identifying more than 300 species of mycobacteria. The huge database is there in this and I make use to tell you about all the possible NTMs, what you are dealing with it as it is very important from the treatment point of view. So, uh, we are already into rapid based culture test. We are not doing uh, solid cultures or a conventional cultures because they take a lot of time and here uh, the things are settled much faster. So, what is the uh, base limit? for a culture to come positive. There has to be minimum 10 to 100 bacteria. So, this thing emphasizes that culture is a very, very sensitive technique compared to microscopy. And with the advent of this liquid based technology, the average turnaround time has also dropped down to 14 days. And again, I, uh, I will share with you, it will depend on the load. I have seen the cases which are 4 plus or uh, 3 plus, they have come positive in 6 days, 5 days. Rapid growers, one day in this type of, so gone is the old myth that cultures are useless and they do not come positive and they take 3-3 three, three months. So, this has totally changed the scenario and liquid based technique is good and it is giving you a sensitivity of uh, very high as compared to the microscopy based investigations. So, what is the detection rate uh, at our laboratory? It is around 20 to 25 percent are the cases which are reported positive by us. Average turnaround time is 10 to 15 days, highly specific, it is gold standard investigation and we are uh, processing somewhere around 20,000 cultures annually. So, this is the composition. You see 50 percent of the cases which I reported positive were from pulmonary side. Now, this includes all your bowel and sputum and gastric lavages. 14 percent were from lymph nodes, then 14 percent were from endometrium, 8 percent from pus, 2 percent were from other categories, 12 percent 14 percent was from body fluids. So, a uh, practically very rewarding technique for both extra pulmonary as well as pulmonary samples. So, uh, and anything can be cultured, uh, no sample barrier is there unlike other techniques which I will discuss further in my presentation. So, now coming to the second part of it, now I have reported you uh, the subject has grown mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or the it has grown some mycobacterium other than tuberculosis complex. So, what has to be done? The next thing that comes to the mind is drug sensitivity. 
So, which test to order, how it is done, how it is interpreted, what are the methods available, what is twin concentration techniques, this we will address to this. See, uh, if we go by uh, ideal, what is written in the books that tuberculosis is 100 percent curable and treatable, but practically it is not happening because of the drug resistance, which is more of a man-made, which I will cover further in the discussion. So, what are the options available for mycobacterium tuberculosis drug sensitivity? At the moment, we are testing some 15 drug molecules. First, uh, 5 are from the first line and 10 are from the second line. In the first line, it is rifampicin, INH, ethambutol, pyrazinamide and streptomycin. And second line is a mixture of aminoglycosides, polypeptides, floxacin groups, ethanamide, cycloserine and PASS. So, how do we do it? See, all these tests are done on critical concentration based test. Now, who decides this critical concentration? There is a body, international body called CLSI and American Thoracic Society. So, based on that, a one particular concentration is decided for each of the drug. It is specific to the each of the drug. So, if the bacteria is able to grow in the presence of a drug, at that particular concentration, it is labeled as resistant and if it does not grow, it is called sensitive. So, that has to be understood and since it is again done on liquid based technology, you uh, are doing tube by tube. You are selecting one concentration, you are going one tube for one drug. So, as a clinician, you have a choice. You can order five molecules, you can order one molecule you can order 15 molecules, any permutation and combination. At our panel, we have different combinations also available, but sometimes that is not desirable as per your need. So, you can order your own combination also. That is possible in this because it is a critical based concentration technique. So, what are the types of resistance? Mono resistance, any, any molecule which is fired or resistant, we will call it mono resistant poly resistant more than 2 dB drugs which are declared resistant. <coughs> MDR, to call it a MDR, it has to be 2 drugs, INH and rifampicin. If they are declared resistant, then you are dealing with a subject which is a multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Then what is this XDR? XDR will be MDR plus one of the injectables on aminoglycosides, amikacin or canamycin or one of the fluoroquinolones, levo, moxie or ofloxacin. So, what is the scenario? Uh, see, in uh, my uh, case, I am getting the cases all over the country. And what I have observed, whatever patients have given positive for M tuberculosis, only 20 to 25 percent get back to us for sensitivity. So, I presume that 75 percent are responding uh, very well to the first line regime. So, this is somewhere in line with WHO also. Now, WHO has done pilot study in three states of India, Andhra, Gujarat and Maharashtra, where they have seen that uh, a resistance in a new case is somewhere around 3 percent and in retreatment case, it is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent. But uh, let us admit one more thing, although TB is declared a notifiable disease, but I believe uh, still notification systems are not that robust in our country. We do not, even in 2014, we do not have a foolproof data from each and every district of this country, what is the resistance pattern going on. If you uh, go to Bombay, this thing, uh, Bombay zoner, there they are reporting MDR around 38 percent, that high. So, it is totally opposite what WHO has to say. But what I have observed in my lab that uh, resistance, 50 percent of the cases uh, which we test in every month to month on the month to month basis were resistant to INH, 40 percent were to rifampicin. <laughs> The main point to be noted over here is INH as everybody all over the world has retreated is more vulnerable, is more delicate molecule which is liable to be resistant. 
and as Dr. Arya has also said in his presentation, rifampicin is a surrogate marker for MDR. If rifampicin is gone, you can take it for granted that you are dealing with MDR case. So, once we have finished now with drug sensitivity uh, testing, what are the possibilities available on MTC side? Now, next uh, bothering topic is non-tuberculous mycobacteria. What we have to do about it? What is the gravity of the uh, problem in uh, country today? So, broadly let us understand what are the types of NTM. They are rapid growers. If they happen to grow before 7 days, they are slow growers if they grow beyond 7 days. So, this is the composition in my laboratory where out of 100 cases, 90 percent were M tuberculosis cases. Only this 9.68 percent were NTM. Now, problem with this NTM, majority of them are environmental commensal also. So, then how to decide whether you are dealing with something commensal or you are going to treat it because everything, all this 9 percent cannot be just condemned as a commensal or a contaminant. So, let us see. Uh, these are some of the common rapid growers, which I am seeing these days after I started using Malditox. M4 Chuchium, M Chelonai, M Abascasis on the rapid grower side. On the slow grower sides, M Avium intracellularly, M Kansai, M Hemophallum, M Genivensis. So, these are some of the few common uh, species. We will uh, gradually see more as uh, we go on using this technique. So, why suddenly this NTM thing has cropped up? Increased awareness is there. Now, you are getting reports from our laboratory which is telling you the species, whether you are dealing with Mycobacterium cansei or Abascasis or Fortuchium or Chelonai. So, better reliable advanced lab diagnosis, gene sequencing is available where it is able to pick even a slightest difference in DNA base less than 1 percent also and declare it as a new species. Malditoff we are using a protein based technology. So, these are the some of the common uh, M Xenopi, M Simi, these are common environmental commensals also. Now, in healthcare facility, tap water cleaned endoscopes, outbreaks due to IVC, local injections, resistance of RGMs so or rapid growers to 2 percent organomerculus, glutaldehyde and so on. And what are the common roots? Cutaneous, respiratory, GI and parenteral. So, when to suspect this? First and foremost, low CD4 count. If you are dealing with a patient which is showing you a very low CD4 count, 50, 100, below 200, a case of AIDS, a cavitatory or multinodular lung disease, two or more expectorated positive sample. Now, you have ordered the test twice or thrice and all three are reporting the same species. So, it cannot be taken lightly or ignored as an environmental uh, commensal. Or you have taken a sample by scopy which is supposed to be a sterile site and you are rest assured that the scope which you were dealing with was properly sterilized. Exclusion of TB. Now, you have totally ruled out that you are no longer dealing with M tuberculosis and you have ruled out malignancy, malignancy also. A subject is a healthcare worker. So, these are the few of the backgrounds which will prompt you provided with a uh, mycobacterium other than tuberculosis reported in culture study also. So, why it is important to know the species? Just I will highlight this is all taken from American thoracic guidelines on NTM treatment. So, they say for M avium intracellular lay, common site is pulmonary and the drug of choice is clarithromycin. Clarithromycin is the principal molecule. The moment now you know that you are dealing with M avium intracellular lay, all other drugs are absolutely excluded. So, this is how speciation will help you in this. M mucogenicum catheter related blood dialysis associated. What are the molecules which should be used? Amikacin, clarithromycin, minosoclin, doxycycline, cefoxetine, imipenem. M immunogenicum is intrinsically resistant to ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, tobramycin and cotrimoxazole. So, what are the drug of choices? Amikacin and clarithromycin. So, the entire knowledge of this is very essential. It is quite exhaustive, but what I am highlighting is 
some species are intrinsically resistant to some drugs, whereas some are just uh, uh, where monomolecule is going to work over there, which is the drug of choice, will drastically cut down the cost and will help you further in uh, uh, doing a target specific treatment. Similarly, M. chilunae, pulmonary skin, soft tissue, the intrinsically resistant to cefoxetine. What are the drug of choices? Doxycycline, quinolone, scotrimoxazole, linezolide, cefoxetine, tobramycin, and imipenem. So, what we have to offer for this? We are offering you the drug sensitivity test for NTM also. Now, here the technique changes. In MTC, I mentioned I am using critical concentration based technique. One concentration, one drug, one tube. Here things change, they are in different dilution and it is a tray based technique. So, what happens when I open this tray of uh, some 13, 14 antimicrobials, I have to use everything. So, here you do not have choice. So, all these molecules will be reported, but according to the species per se, you choose the drug of choice and proceed ahead. So, this is a beautiful uh, laboratory at Dr. Lal Path Lab, which is BSL 3 and CAP and NABL accredited. These are the uh, instruments which I was talking. We have three of them MGITs, each capable of handling around 1000 TB cultures. So, we have got the state of art equipment to do this uh, job. These are how the tube look like. This uh, yellow color thing which you are seeing is a fluorescent marker, uh, which ignites the moment the TB grows in this. So, now coming to the uh, immunological or blood based test, what is the role of this? So, once this ELISA test, they were uh, darling uh, of all the clinicians, but now they are banned test. First time in the history, a WHO has come out with a negative policy, which has across the country banned all the serological tests. So, ELISA is no longer a test as far as tuberculosis goes. So, then uh, what is the next test that is available <coughs> is interferon gamma release assay that is popularly known as TB gold also. TB gold is a brand name but uh, base is interferon gamma release assay. So, what is this interferon gamma release assay? It is nothing but a in vitro MONTU testing only. It is the in vitro replica of MONTU. Only thing is here it is more methodical. I will come uh, down to the differences what we exactly do. It is basically a cocktail of uh, three antigens where the blood is incubated with and we try to measure the gamma interferon levels. So, if it crosses beyond certain cutoff, we label it as positive. If it is below cutoff level, we call it negative. So, what is the role of this uh, gamma interferon uh, release assays? As far as active tuberculosis is concerned, this has got no role. Only diagnosis latent tuberculosis infection it can't uh, differentiate also between active and chronic disease. And unfortunately, in India, we do not have any policy on treatment of latent tuberculosis. So, cannot distinguish between active and latent TB, cannot distinguish between recent and old infection, should not be used to determine efficacy of treatment. So, uh, which are the scenarios where we will like to use this then? So, there are two zones, one is disease risk category, other is transmission based category. So, let us first see this disease risk category. Here it is the HIV, child contact, diabetes, massive study is going on in diabetic subject and uh, the role of gamma interferon release assay, immunosuppressive. Now, uh, lot of this transplants are happening, uh, lot of this rheumatoid arthritis thing is emerging, left, right and center methotrexates and very high level immunomodulators are being used. Also, these are the subjects which at any moment will convert to active tuberculosis. So, this may serve as a, a marker in such zoner whether your subject is passing towards tuberculosis or not. 
then there is transmission risk category that is contact dialysis unit and so on so let us quickly go through the dif major differences between the montu that is tuberculous based skin testing and interferon gamma release assay in vitro in vivo uh, cocktail of three antigen it is antigen soup this is automated now this is not automated it is all manual some person will uh, read uh, redness and induration some will put scale horizontally some will put vertically so lot of subjective error scope is there in this not affected by bcg and ntms this is affected by bcg and ntms which is result with one patient visit two patient visits are required so again timing is critical somebody is turning at, at the end of fourth day or third day or 48 hours so minimal inter reader variability all machine based fully automated here it is all manual outstanding surveillance tool if results electronic poor surveillance tool results are totally confidential results are not confidential so this is about the sensitivity of tst around 67 to 72% 78 to 83% in case of tb gold specificity 98 to 100% 59% in case of tst so what is the key message for this gamma release assay that they should be restricted for latent infection screening of high risk group if used the person suspected with active tuberculosis these tests will be positive in large proportion that is since 40% of the indians have latent infection this can result in serious overtime treatment with four drug regime with economic and health consequences for patients antibiotic abuse is a big concern already in india and we are seeing mdr xdr and tdr strains so coming to the uh, final algorithm uh, uh, pcr or molecular based diagnosis so what is the minimum detection limit for a pcr it is around 10 bacilli and what is the turn around time 24 to 48 hours 40 to 60% is a detection rate in smear negative cases 90 to 100% in smear positive or culture positive cases so one thing you have to remember this is a dna based test so not a very good test to monitor your treatment so this test should never be ordered to monitor your treatment uh, that uh, you have to remember as far as pcr is concerned so we are doing real time based pcr means everything is automated right from the extraction to amplification to final detection is all computerized and on real time basis and we have got a uh, very robust in house based pcr called mycosure so objective is to detect mtbc directly uh, from clinical samples so this is validated across all the specimens except blood so the in house based pcr is uh, functional for all the specimen no uh, this thing is there for uh, bearing is there as in other nucleic acid based test is there positive result demonstrate the presence of mtbc but does not distinguishes between live and dead bacteria negative result does not necessarily mean absence of mtbc either inhibition is there or target below the limit of detection what what do we mean by target see one thing you have to very clearly understand in molecular based test is how it does how it goes further ahead a dna is taken out and a target which is very specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis or ntm they are incorporated in it so generally we work on three or four target one target is common to the entire mycobacteria c family other target that is mpb64 is restricted to mtc only and there is one more target which is representative of ntm population so if they are in very very uh, low level then you may miss it or if there is some inhibition is there for example a case of cough and all treated with azithromycin subjected to pcr this will interfere with the test and will give you a false negative result although we do have a system 
to take care of this, but still some percentage of 3 to 5 percent this possibility is there. So, what are the options available on molecular side? One is Microsure as I highlighted already. The other is gene expert and line probe assay that is Hein assay popularly known as and gene expert is also known as nucleic acid cartridge based test. So, if you will uh, happen to go through the standards of care which was launched on World TB Day, it is mentioned nucleic acid cartridge, cartridge, cartridge based assays. Nowhere gene expert and terms called Hein because they are all brand names. So, line probe assay represents Heinz and cartridge based assay represents gene expert. So, recently they have got FDA also just a uh, month back. So, examining DNA of a specific genes for mutations known to be associated with phenotypic resistance. So, this PCR based technology is giving you information about what type of uh, mycobacteria you are dealing with number one and number two is about drug resistance. So, again on the drug resistance side it goes by target wise. For example, if you are dealing with rifampicin, it is RPOB gene. If you are dealing with INHA, there are two or three genes like INHA, CAD G. If you come to pyrazinamide, there are different genes. So, it works on this uh, gene based mutation uh, technique. And what are uh, the pitfalls that also we will uh, discover in this? Laboratory based test, DNA sequencing, real time PCR, F, uh, non FDA written, but now it is FDA approved, genotype uh, that is line probe assay and gene expert is there in this. So, uh, let us talk about now gene expert thing. What is this gene expert doing? It is an automated commercial system for identification of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and mutation in RPOB gene. So, this will give you twin information whether the sample is containing MTC and whether it is resistance or sensitive to rifampicin. But what about MOT or mycobacterium other than tuberculosis? That will be missed out by this. It will not give you any information about mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. So, how does this work? It is the uh, uses again real time based PCR and it targets again RPOB gene, which is very, very specific as far as rifampicin is concerned. So, everything is taking place inside a cassette and you are able to get results in 2 hours. So, that is the beauty of this technology. Minimal hands on manipulation platform is random access. This is how the report of gene expert comes, MTB detected and rifampicin resistance not detected or detected either ways. So, expert uh, now, what are the samples you are going to test on this? Pulmonary samples, yes. Totally, uh, now even in the recent standards of care for diagnosis, they have said that where resources crunch is not there, no resource moderation is there, then gene expert should be the first line of test in this. So, expert shows a good sensitivity also in uh, lymph nodes or aspirates gastric fluid, CSF, other tissue samples, but it has a poor sensitivity as far as pleural fluid is concerned. The sensitivity drops down to 42 percent. So, pleural fluid it is not that good technique. Again, this technique should never be used on blood, stool and urine. See, blood is absolutely a no sample as far as molecular base test are concerned because it is a natural inhibitor of PCR reaction. So, hardly you are going to pick anything on this. Again, stool urine gene expert is not advisable, pleural fluid is less sensitive. For CSF also there is guideline has come now in the recent uh, standards of care. You get the CSF sent to expert or our lab based at that is Microsure. If it tells you MTC detected, go ahead. It is a life saving test and very rapid test in that regard. And uh, the best part about this molecular based test is they are positive in 60 to 70 percent negative smear negative cases. Same applies, same algorithm applies to extra pulmonary samples also. They fall in that zoner 
majority of your extra pulmonary samples will be smear negative. So, these are the techniques, either you go for mycosure or you go for line probe assay or gene expert, they are going to catch hold of this. So, now let us uh, discuss the differences between the uh, three types of molecular based tests which are available with us. We have a mycosure where all samples are possible except blood and uh, this test is equally sensitive to the WHO endorsed test and the best part of it is the moment it is coming positive if we are detecting MTC, we are doing reflex testing to four molecular drugs, which none of the gene expert and high NSA is offering you. Gene expert will tell you drug resistance about rifampicin, Hein will tell you INH and rifampicin. Again, they are consortium controlled and I am very pleased to share with you that Dr. Lal is himself a chairman of this consortium, where they have committed to give this uh, endorsed test at a controlled rates of uh, 2000 rupees for gene expert and 1650 for Heinz assay. But beyond uh, these two drugs, these tests become very expensive. Gene expert, nothing is available beyond two uh, drugs. On Hein, yes, it is available, but it is very expensive. But MycoSure, uh, which we are doing for you, if it comes empty as a uh, service to the human uh, mankind, we are giving you four drugs that is Ethambutol, Rifampicin, INH and Pyrazinamide free of cost in that cost only. And that is also uh, placed uh, below gene expert as far as cost goes. So irrespective of smear positivity, uh, this will be good idea to go ahead for uh, molecular based test. First line drugs are available to reflex MTC, I have already shared with you, MTC and NTM are detected in MycoSure, only MTC will be covered. Sometimes queries come to me, I have sent PCR, that is telling NTM, and gene expert. Sir, we have a query regarding Heinz assay, what are the specimens to be taken? Uh, specimen are same as I mentioned for the gene expert slide, let me take you back. All the specimen, uh, low sensitivity in the pleural fluid, never send us blood, urine and stool, tissues are welcome, sputum, bal, gastric lavage, CSF, gastric fluids and now the hine is also in advanced generation, earlier they used to say that send only for smear positive cases, but it is no longer true today, both the smear negative, smear positive. Even if you are having a growth and you want urgent uh, drug sensitivity, then that positive growth can be subjected to hind test and get a complete algorithm on that, both uh, uh, first lines and second lines and so on. So benefits of molecular detection of drug resistance, rapid results within days as compared to weeks for conventional testing, expedite further conventional testing, so uh, uh, you can immediately uh, go for a molecular based test, suppose it tells you rifampicin resistance or uh, INH resistance. Immediately you can subject to liquid based culture, start your therapy of MDR, wait for the culture results also to be out. Because uh, what happens as far as molecular techniques are concerned, if you uh, talk about rifampicin, they are very robust to the tune of 98%. Because single gene is involved in majority of the cases which is responsible for the resistance. But when we come to other molecules, for example INH, this rate drops down by 10 percent because multiple genes are there, INH A is there, B is there, CAD G is there. And when you come to further molecules, the pathway becomes more complex, 4-4 four, four genes are there, 5 genes are there, that is sometimes beyond the scope of this PCR also. So that is why it is said if you detect resistance and uh, clinically some dilemma is there, better to correlate with culture based drug sensitivity testing also, because culture is going to express the entire molecule of the organism, whereas molecular is going to be target specific. And one more thing is there, suppose something emerges new, some new mutant emerges, so that will be beyond uh, the scope of this. 
that possibility also has to be there in the back of mind. So, these are some of the pros and cons of this investigation. So, uh, some assays are closed system as I have already shared with you, line probe assays or cartridge based uh, gene expert, there are closed based systems. Development of technologies uh, requiring limited biosafety infrastructure information provided by some platform may be used to enhance accuracy of conventional DST. So, what are the possibilities of disconcordance, human error, lab error, not necessarily looking at the same segment of DNA, I have ordered to lab A which is saying resistance, I have ordered to lab B which is saying sensitive. So, here if you are aware about the targets, your first question should be well, what targets you have used for INH? The lab A must be using only INH A, uh, B and CAT G, whereas the lab B is using only first target INH A. So, that will lead to discrepancy. Limited genes and sites within the genes are targeted emerging resistance. That may be not at all detected as I shared with you, suddenly some new mutant strain arises because these are all retrograde based investigation which were selected on a huge database and some targets were selected. Sir, so, pa sir we have a question, what should be the preferred uh, scope, gene expert or Heinz assay regarding the two? See, uh, gene expert and Heinz assay as far as sensitivity and specificity are concerned, both are same. Only thing is time lag. Uh, gene expert will take two hours, Heinz will take one to two days. It is a, a more complex. Whereas gene expert will be rapid. For example, if you are dealing with a case of uh, TB meningitis, go for gene expert, you get the answer in two hours. Otherwise, if uh, you are more comfortable uh, in a sputum where you want a information on two drugs, you are not happy with rifampicin only, then choose Heinz. So, it will be case to case and the need of urgency and otherwise cost per se, technique per se both are equivalent, there is no difference. So, this is the PCR data which I will like to share. See, I criticize blood so much, but unfortunately this is the number one specimen as far as molecular based investigations are concerned and look, uh, look at the result in blood PCR only three cases were positive. This must be some fulminant or miliary type of case which was picked by this. But come to the respiratory samples, more than uh, 1, 0, 4 plus 35, more than uh, 30 percent is the positivity in pulmonary sample. Now, look at the this thing, uh, endometriums, almost uh, 25 percent. Look at the pus, these are the site specific samples uh, where it is uh, rewarding rather than blood. Blood is absolutely no sample as far as molecular based investigation is concerned. So, this is also uh, uh, the com uh, this thing composition of MTMs, MTCs and NTM which were detected. The green color bar is of mycobacterium tuberculosis, blue color bar is for NTMs. So, this is in different scenarios, for example, pus 31 percent were MTCs, 10 percent were non-MTCs, then sputum 25 percent were MTCs and 8 percent were NTMs and so on. So, uh, what are the uh, PCR based interpretation as far as CDC guideline is concerned? If nucleic acid amplification that is PCR in our common language is positive, AFB is positive, <coughs> presume it to be tuberculosis, start the treatment. If PCR is positive, AFB is negative, use clinical judgment for starting the treatment while waiting for culture results. If PCR is negative, AFB is positive, test for the inhibitors, rule out some antimicrobial intake, repeat the test. If inhibition is not detected and if both are negative, repeat sputum, presume it to be NTM infection. If nucleic acid is negative, AFB microscopy is also negative, use clinical judgment while waiting for the culture results. What are the other molecular based tests? Now, this is true net test, this is our desi gene expert. 
which is under evaluation at ICMR. So, if this becomes successful, I think the cost will come down by uh, almost it will drop down to one fifth of gene expert, but still it is under the validation phase. And what is this LAM based test that is lipo arbaminin antigen test? It will be specially it is a urine based test. This will be, should be out I think in coming year. It will be boon in your HIV positive subject. Moment this antigen appears in the urine, you be certain that subject has got the tuberculosis infection and push for the treatment. So, both these uh, tests are under heavy validation and should be out any time. So, ideal algorithm for DST rapid molecular screening for rifampicin resistance using either expert or line probe assay or hine assay. If positive begin MDR treatment pending full DST using liquid based cultures to further confirm this. Once full DST is obtained modify the second line, because going on second line is not easy. It is a bad news for, sub for your subject. It is less potent than first line more expensive, more toxic, adherence will be issue. You, you have to deal with this for two years. So, adherence will be big problem over here. So, what are the, uh, what is the take home message or summary? The principal methods for TB diagnostics are microscopy, culture and PCR. PCR can't replace neither microscopy nor culture, but it complements both and no testing replaces clinical assessment. I have to share this good news over here. Now, okay, fine, we have done all these tests, but now the standards of care on the standard number five, they have agreed that still you are going to miss 30 percent of the cases. On the extra pulmonary side, you are still going to miss more. So, they have created a new category called probable TB cases. So, you take your clinical history into account, supplemental evidences like ADA levels, ESRs, X-ray, clinical history, history of contact, even TB gold, at least if it is positive, it is telling you that okay, some sort of contact is there. You can take this and uh, some difficult situations like tuberculoma, someone was asking, how you will take site specific sample or a case of a ITB where you are going to get a site specific sample. So, all this fell in a gamut of probable TB cases, do the treatment, notify also because it has become a notifiable disease, but notify it under a category of probable TB cases and go ahead with the treatment. Thank you for a patient listening and these are my contact details where anyone can reach me. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shalab. We have few queries. Yeah. Uh, a doctor wants to know about a clarity for blood. Should he go for DBPCR or Quantiferon? See, blood is absolutely no sample. And of course, I agree with you, there is a desire that one day some good marker, a reliable, uh, specific and sensitive marker will be developed. <laughs> but so far, science has failed on that. So, blood is absolutely no test as far as TB is concerned. Now, coming to gold, again I have uh, shared with you that it is a test for latent tuberculosis infection. You cannot make it as a sole ground to label a subject, a TB patient and go ahead with the treatment. So, this cannot be the sole anchor as far as TB gold is concerned. Sir, another question is, if a patient has dead bacteria, then gene expert is going to be positive. Okay. But patient has recovered from TB. So, in that case, what should be the ideal test? Again, uh, uh, as far as monitoring the TB case is concerned, this question has also been answered in uh, standard of care. Uh, if anybody will like to have that copy, I, they can give their email IDs to us. I will personally mail to you. There it has written, there is a total note about monitoring the therapy. You have to do microscopic examination at the end of intensive phase, that is two months and then repeat after four months. So, if that is absolutely fine, go ahead. Uh, your treatment has worked properly. Coming to the extra pulmonary case, where 
uh, again they have uh, sr was also talking about the tissue based tuberculosis where the culture has failed microscopy is not at all rewarding pcr is coming negative but if you are able to demonstrate a granuloma on a microscopy that is a acceptable evidence as far as tissue based tb is concerned so that should not be a deterrent for you to start a treatment and monitoring extra pulmonary case also clinical history with supplemental evidence is again acceptable in the latest standards of care so i uh, request all of you should uh, go through this standards of care which is totally developed for our indian scenario that will be uh, very good uh, learning experience that answers all our gray area questions the next question is if the culture is negative for endometrial biopsy should adt be started based on the quantiferon results if quantiferon is positive should a treatment be started ba based on that culture is negative for See, uh, uh, i have traveled across the country and uh, there are lot of questions by gynecologists that infertility is there we start akt and it responds but my next question to them uh, did you evaluate it for chlamydias and mycoplasmas also because that also responds to this tb cocktail therapy so tb gold again is no answer uh, alone for uh, endometrium based this thing if you are in a position get a good curettage or get a biopsy piece get one histopat done get one gene expert or mycosure or line probe assay whichever you desire that will answer your question so uh, how many people have attempted what is the false positivity of uh, menstrual blood uh, yes uh, it will uh, create it is not a ideal sample it will create a nuisance because of a genital uh, based commensal or uh, mycobacterium smegmatis that will uh, create nuisance in this what Dr. is the Malik, uh, yeah. what is this uh, Uh, sensitivity and specificity of this uh, pcr based test in abdominal tuberculosis see uh, tissue based test all tissue based test fall under a category of extra pulmonary or uh, let us further refine it as smear negative category so 60 to 70 percent is the catch so in extra pulmonary cases then want to know a correlation between fnac and afb culture in extra pulmonary cases correlation between fnac, FNAC and, and AFB. see problem with this fnac is volume is very minuscule number 1 they are posi bacillary that is problem number 2 so many times i have seen uh, you go on searching a slide and slide hardly you will come across one or two bacilli so if you are able to demonstrate that along with some granuloma you are able to demonstrate and if volume is very less i think don't go for culture with it go for pcr based test in that scenario that will be more helpful because a certain amount of 2 ml 1 ml at least volume is uh, essential to do justice for uh, culture based study compared to this thing so another question is for extra pulmonary tb samples suppose it is a tb node aspirate is very small in volume wise yeah, it is very yeah. low so how should we divide the sample for fnac for cytopathology for afb smear or gene expert how you go for cytopathology because against chances of getting a smear negative are very high demonstrate a granuloma with your clinical history with esrs and all positive some radiology some evidence of contact history and so on will serve the purpose and that is very much now incorporated in standards of tb care also any other question for dr shalab from the audience nice presentation dr shalab thank you i have a question when, uh, sometimes you report mycobacterium tuberculosis detected low correct so many inclinations ask what is the significance uh, of this low means uh, uh, the volume of dna which was picked in it was on a lower side but it is no, there but they, it yeah, is they want to know whether it is yes it or is no. significant that is why it was reported in the interest of patient we cannot ignore it uh, and sometimes we do write that uh, rifampicin resistance detected low level low level yeah So, so in such cases uh, you again revisit your history 
uh, how the patient is doing with your uh, tuberculosis drug. There is no MDR history, there is no relapse history. And I have already discussed that in a new scenario or in a fresh case, the chances of resistance are less. Because TB otherwise as a bacteria is not that uh, commonly resistant to all the available drugs. That as per WHO noting is around 3%. So in such cases, what, what this will do, two possibilities are there. One, maybe the molecular test has picked up some silent mutation, which when you will confirm on the liquid based uh, text or technology, that will not translate into the resistance. Or in other words, it will raise the MIC bar. For example, the rifampicin concentration, critical concentration is 1 microgram per ml. And you have picked up a low resistance. So what this low resistance is doing? If you measure in the proper dilutions, that is very exhaustive uh, methodology, it will raise the MIC to let us say 0.65 or 0.7. But then it does not matter. It is uh, still giving you a scope that this will work plus your clinical history is there. How the patient is responding uh, to the so first line? Uh, resistance low means it is resistant. No, low, see, all in such type of cases, better to order liquid-based drug sensitivity okay. also, okay. and wait for the result. In the meantime, you stick to your first line regime. Thank you. And if after two months again uh, you are seeing on your clinical parameter things are not improving microscopy is coming positive then you again order the test also order liquid based culture test and uh, process the full gamut of anti uh, uh, tb drugs available on this if i could answer that uh, dr geeta very nice uh, niraj uh, that means you are being primed for a uh, yeah, you're, you're being primed for a resistant, possible resistance which is developing. And as we know, a bacterial population, there are very few resistant bacteria. And by selective uh, picking up, either by a bad chemotherapy or a selective dots in an MDR case, they grow up, grow up, and finally become a uh, secondary or acquired resistance. So as Dr. Chalab said, you should go for a simultaneously liquid-based culture because those are more reliable. And they give you the real test. And it, it will give you some leverage of extending the treatment of intensive phase beyond two months to the third month, at least at the end of the two months, if your gene expert is low, because you get a very rapid result. So you are not discontinuing your adequate chemotherapy and not letting the patient go into a true relapse or a true treatment failure. It will be just extending for a possible failure. So it's a good uh, clinical uh, judgment to make at the end of two months if you have a low resistance. At least you are picking it up and continuing the therapy rather than stopping the intensive phase of four drugs. And then also you can continue beyond three months to four months. So because then not all bacterial population would be absolutely resistant. They will still continue to die because of sterilizing effect of uh, either parazinamide or maybe because of low activity of ethambutol, even if they are rifampicin resistance. So that's important. Thank you, sir. Uh, for Dr. Animesh, we have a question. The duration of steroids in plural infusions. Yeah, see, uh, plural infusions are uh, <coughs> as such uh, 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 very easy to manage. Unless there is a large plural effusion and you want a symptomatic relief, usually the trend is you do not tap these plural effusions. The reason behind is you stimulate a plural effusion and you form a fibrin inside a plural effusion it will rapidly organize, give rise to a multi locatable effusion if you do not drain it completely. So you may create more trouble if you are not very, very methodical in draining a plural effusion. Some people, are, in fact, there have been trials earlier, those trials are way beyond, not beyond 1980s or 1985s, when people started using high dose steroids to manage tuberculosis effusion, which were large and which were probably not tappable. The dose was 40 to 60 milligram of vicinon or prednisone per day. But mind you, rifampicin decreases the viability of prednisone by 50 percent. So the efficacy or efficacious dose is only half. If you give 40, it is 20 milligram. If you give 60, it is 30 milligram. The duration would be 21 days to 28 days. And then you taper it off over a 7 to 10 day period. The only benefit, it does not. Uh, uh, you know, shorten the course of chemotherapy. 
it only rapidly resolution of pleural effusion is there. That is the only advantage you can get. It does not even prevent thickening or any pleural fibrosis. That is very, very important. So, you should be cautious giving steroids because some people may react badly and they may just come up with lot of swelling and lot of steroid side effects and then you are possibly if you have a disseminated tuberculosis, it may get accentuated if not treated adequately. That is very, very important. I had some more questions yeah, to answer. The effect on uh, pulmonary, uh, the effect of pulmonary TB on eyes. Yeah, that is a difficult question to answer because we do not see too many uh, eye involvement, but as per literature, we have iritis and iridocyclitis. We may have a lacrimal gland tuberculosis, which may be mimicked with sarcoidosis or sometimes lymphoma. We have had few cases, the only answer is biopsy. Then you can have tubercular retinitis, though rare. And as Dr. Shala pointed out, in standards of care, you have probable diagnosis. But all these probable diagnoses of extrapulmonary tuberculosis, you must diligently look for a tubercular pathology in the lungs. You may find correlate in the lung to get your a diagnosis on a firmer footing, either a small pulmonary lesion or a lymph node, which is sampleable now by uh, either uh, uh, endoscopic bronchial ultrasound or endoscopic gastric ultrasound, a subcarinal or a paratracheal node in the lymph node stations. So, practically about 90 percent of lymph nodes can be sampled by endobronchial or endo uh, uh, gastric ultrasound. That is very, very important and get a test which can be sent for either microsure or gene expert. And, uh, and there was the another question, question yeah. is uh, how to deal with dual diagnosis of TB? Now, what do you mean by dual diagnosis? Maybe it means that in one test it is coming out of positive and in the other it is coming out to be negative. Uh, that is probably the same algorithm as uh, Dr. Chalab said about nucleic acid amplification test. Again, it would fall in the category of probable TB diagnosis. And again, you must do a survey of the entire body, make a clinical judgment whether could be a clinical yes tuberculosis or no tuberculosis. Our best is to wait and watch, observe the patient, it is not too critical and the patient is not too serious. There is another question about how do you have any other means to diagnose pleural effusion other than ADA. Yeah. Uh, see, ADA is very, very sensitive and highly specific beyond a cutoff limit of 40. And if you have a low ADA as is about 2 or 3, which we find in transudative effusion due to congestive heart failure, uh, 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 due to liver failure or nephrotic syndrome, and we can safely rule out tubercular effusion in them even if the protein is high or lymphocytes are there. And even if you have some positive either gene based test or maybe a low detection of uh, microsure or whatever. If the ADA is low, you should reconsider your clinical judgment as of tubercular effusion in any body fluid, particularly in pleural effusion. Simultaneously, you can ask for TB culture. So TB culture, That exactly. works very well, very well in this. Wait for the results to come till that time you continue. With and the if there is a cons then what we have found that if you repeat the sample of ADA, the borderline ADAs which are picked up around 25 to 30 or maybe 31, 32, which are not very sure, you may get a higher value next time because probably of the reactivation of macrophages may be 40, 45. Then of course, if more invasive tests are required, you can go for a plural biopsy, which is thoracoscopic biopsy, which we do. It is an OPD procedure by a uh, flexi rigid thoracoscope or you can have a CT guided biopsy and then again look for coexisting pulmonary tuberculosis, which you can have a sputum sample or a bronchial alveol lavage sample. So, that would give you a diagnosis of tubercular pleural effusion. Yeah. Another question was how to proceed in cases of medicinal lymphadenopathy? Uh, medicinal lymphadenopathy, we in a, uh, yeah, the question was more specific in a small center where they do not have recourse to a probably a CT scan or they have a CT scan, but they cannot have EBUS or EUS diagnosis, how do we decide it is uh, tubercular lymphadenitis? I know it is very, very difficult. Before this came into being, it was all empirical. Let me be very frank in admitting that we used to suspect, correlate with MANTU or tuberculin skin testing and uh, see that if the patient improves in the trial of anti-tubercular therapy or not. But there are certain signs. A right paratracheal hyaluronidopathy, which is more than 2 centimeters, usually is tubercular. If there is this definite necrosis on CT scan, it is quite highly likely to be tuberculosis. And if you have a pulmonary infiltrate with lymphadenitis, it is highly likely to be tuberculosis. 
very simple thing which we normally do, we always examine the neck and do an ultrasound of the neck, very meticulous ultrasound of the neck would identify a small node in the neck which can be easily aspirable. That is the most easiest thing to do in a suspect case of, of uh, media stellar tuberculosis, that is what we normally do. And sir, another approach uh, for a case of suspected musculoskeletal TB. Again, the, see it is combined basically skeletal TB is probably more different than a muscle TB. Muscle TB is probably very rare and you see occasional psoas abscess or an abscess uh, which is draining from a rib or the spinal area in the thoracic region or in the neck region into the uh, supraclavicular area. There a simple aspirate would probably give you a diagnosis of uh, abscess in the muscle region. Uh, as far as skeletal tuberculosis is concerned, there are specific signs uh, in the uh, CT scan on MRI that interval disc involvement or disruption of disc or end plate disorganization, paraspinal abscesses. You can aspirate and subject them culture more to, uh, to the microsure and gene expert. That is very, very uh, good and that is how we do diagnose. So, uh, this is for Dr. Shala. Yeah. Can we use direct isolated DNA for the Heinz assay? Uh, you can use, no problem. <coughs> and then the question is for PCR uh, method, the efficacy of drug resistance basically. Uh, rifampicin, it is very, very robust to the tune of 98 percent. Then INH, it falls by 10 percent and other drugs in the, to the tune of around 75 to 60 percent especially second lines. So, so the question, the next question by another doctor is, if MDR is positive by Heinz and is negative by a rapid DST, so what should be the, what should be followed and what are the reasons for the same? See, again, uh, it is target based test. Hein is doing, uh, using different targets, gene expert has got its own limitation, it will tell you about rifampicin only. So, you go ahead with the MDR regime uh, because rifampicin in any way is a surrogate marker for this and order liquid based drug sensitivity test in the parallel, wait for the uh, results to be out to take a final con on escalation or de-escalation. One last question, uh, it is said that you should not order test resistance for ethambutol, pyrazinamide and uh, other yeah, you say, can order see if they uh, be reliable if, or not. That's uh, if they are saying uh, sensitive, yeah, and the same uh, deja vu you are seeing in your clinical uh, this thing also, the patient is improving uh, with the regime. The molecular test is also reporting sensitive. On sensitive side, it is okay, okay. but on resistance, uh, they have put a rider. This should be confirmed with liquid based drug sensitivity. Uh, my question is to Dr. Animesh. Uh, Dr. Saab, many a times we come across patients who have got mesenteric lymphadenitis yeah. on ultrasound. Uh, so, uh, many patients of uh, uh, antric fever also have the same problem. So, how to differentiate and how to proceed in this case? Because uh, patient will not agree for. Uh, uh, CT guide biopsy in such cases, Mo most of the patients they are a bit afraid. So, how should we proceed? See, mesenteric lymphadenitis is a different than uh, posterior abdominal or para aortic lymphadenitis. See, so mesenteric lymphadenitis is very difficult to, to catch on a CT guided assistant uh, biopsy unless there are huge big lymph nodes. Then, only way you can address is by a laparoscopy, uh, that okay. is the only way. And uh, I would uh, probably find more ascites in these patients and if you can tap the ascites and you can wait and watch because mesenteric lymphadenitis we see but less commonly than uh, a combination of paraiotic lymphadenitis with mediastinal lymphadenitis which is more accessible by EBUS or EUS. And some people are very brave, uh, the CT scan interventional radiologists who can go into the paraiotic lymph node and they can even go through the aorta and big vessels and get a sample. Uh, uh, the paraiotic lymph node because even by surgical or an open surgical method, they are the most difficult nodes to sample. Yeah, and uh, yes. the most difficult uh, aspect of treatment is they keep on persisting on ultrasound even after an adequate treatment of initial intensive phase of three months, extended sometimes or our own basic, you know, our own uh, assumption that probably you are not missing too much, you can extend for fourth month continue up to one year and then still find lymph nodes of similar size because some ultrasound fellow will say there may be some reduction by 3 millimeter, 4 millimeter, 
the patient is on your head, you have treated for sir one year, what has happened to my nose, they are still persisting. He will then shop around and uh, he will probably condemn your judgment and treatment. So, it is probably the most difficult thing to manage a persistent lymphadenopathy on mediastinum and parioretic lymphadenopathy. Mesentric okay. is less common, mesentric is less common. Yeah. Sir, one question to you. Uh, I have one patient who was sputum positive, but his uh, this uh, TB ferron gold was negative. So, uh, how is TB it possible? Why, why did you order TB ferron? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. He went to some other doctor. He was already on treatment and he got this test done. Then he came to me, he said, look at this. See, uh, let me once again repeat, TB gold is no tool at all to monitor your case or to diagnose the active case No, but is it possible like this, like you said it is positive in all uh, latent tuberculosis yes. and if it did not have any uh, tuberculosis? Was the subject on any uh, immunosuppressant? No, no, but he powerful. is immunocompromised because he is an alcoholic. Achha. Yeah. We, we so have uh, situations where MAN2 is positive even in a sputum positive sample. So, uh, it is same as having a sputum positive. No, that is very, uh, I mean if you have, are having low immunity, uh, you may produce bacteria, but you may not mount the response That's to it. So, Montux will be negative. Yeah. Same for uh, IGRA also. So, I think uh, both are what he okay. showed that gadget notification, we should be brave enough to put that in our clinics that we should Correct. not order. Uh, IGRA related test in most of the I to, Yeah, I told him the same so thing. So, that uh, at Once least they say they believe is it, very strong see, uh, it is coming from uh, the government and it is accepted worldwide. See, uh, we must understand over here, uh, in one breath we are saying that 2 million new cases are emerging in India every <coughs> year. But, and these all these endorsed tests, now they are I think one and a half year old. Oh, yeah. Till date, only I think 30 or 40 thousand tests are done on this. That is uh, how much? Sir, what is, is the cause for that? Uh, is it the cost? It the is cost the see, lack of knowledge to the I, practicing I physicians? Know. One, one twentieth. Uh, <laughs> hardly any thing. Uh, what I want to stress that uh, clinicians should make use of the three pillars as we have discussed, microscopy, nucleic acid amplification or culture which is still underutilized and still the ro uh, notification is not robust. So, people should come out, uh, then uh, we will have some different scenario and uh, maybe we will able to explain it much better. This is the last question uh, for the session. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for a very lucid presentation. I think you revised our entire tuberculosis in one hour. Uh, in my own observations, you see, I see a lot of media external tuberculosis patients in Shroff Hospital, where I see a lot of sarcoid and TB. Often it is a count yes. of discussion, and we use uh, Mantus to a lot of uh, benefit. Now, since the advent of Endosono, we have been going uh, this test very frequently. In fact, we have got two ongoing studies, and uh, what we have observed is that an endosono confirmed media standard lymphadenopathy tuberculosis patients, six months duration does not suffice. Exactly. Uh, once we get a check CT done after say one year or 15 months of therapy, we still find that lymph nodes which were earlier size around 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters, we still have a lymph node of around 10, 12 millimeters. So, do we leave the lymph nodes there or if we uh, go on with the treatment for extended duration of time? So, my observation on those slides was, I mean, it was very specifically highlighted that six months is the duration of lymph node tuberculosis. Months. But I think often we have to resort to an extended regimen which may go up till 18 months. And yeah. uh, I mean. Uh, in fact, uh, what these studies have shown is uh, pre EBUS or EUS era <laughs> and a lot of uh, retrospective analysis and ongoing analysis on TB uh, nodal aspirate samples on EBUS and EUS being going on in PGI Chandigarh. What they are doing is they are doing all kinds of uh, a gene expert and DNA based tests and sarcoid related antigen tests and everything possible which can be extracted from a lymph node in media cell lymphadenopathy and divide them into yes definite tuberculosis, possible tuberculosis or not tuberculosis and then combining with uh, IGRA, uh, MAN2 testing and not MAN2 testing and cultures of any other body fluids. And uh, again they are repeating samples at 3 months to 6 months and at the end of 12 months. But they are sampling only nodes which are significant that is beyond at least 8 or 10 millimeter appreciable nodal size on CT scan beyond a stipulated time. And if you see a node, the conclusion is that is interim, uh, which is an expert opinion. If you see a node 
at the end of one year which is about 10 millimeters or less you should probably be safe enough to stop the treatment and if you see 12 millimeter and above you should resample it for a possible drug resistance or a failure regime number one then again comes whether you can do a gene expert which will detect a dead mycobacteria so again there is a big confounding factor so they say that 12 months and beyond should not be the practice in mm -hmm. lymph node tuberculosis you may land up with an occasional case after three months down the line he develops a fresh node somewhere or has an increase in the existing node you can't just do anything about it you it's not that you have heard earlier and now you want to uh, uh, you know patch up with things but i think 12 months in any uh, nodal uh, disease is uh, quite uh, adequate and safe and recommendation it's not beyond recommendation that's important but only thing is uh, how to determine the size how often can you order a ct scan that to in a women or a reproductive age group where maximum number of cases lie between you know 17 to 35 years of age particularly in women women are bigger sufferers of lymph node tuberculosis than men you would have a, a general observation yeah. and they would respond erratically also they will have more immune reconstitution syndrome they will have cox phenomena new nodes coming up so again compounding the factor whether they have a, a poor response whether they have a drug resistant tb so uh, i think uh, it's important now we have a low dose ct scan to let the public know so that is again an important factor we order specific area only for the higher nodes a low dose ct scan that decreases the radiation to nearly one tenth so you can order multiple cts down the line over a progress of the disease so coming to conclusion if it is 10 millimeter or less you're safe in stopping if it is more you should resample by ebus if possible i think most of the patients you know they don't want to get an invasive exactly. testing again that is a practical scenario we but face but you stop there that's that's what and they are not willing for an end, uh, end of the treatment CT scan either? Uh, patients, I think in kind of practice, you are there and I am there, they agree for a CT scan they, because finance yeah. is usually not a problem. Yeah. That is there. But, but there is a the question there, how do you manage? Uh, manage uh, disease of low socioeconomic. Yes. Madam, I think. Uh, nee, lymph node tuberculosis is now uh, of. Madam, uh, I think. Uh, Madam, I think I object to it. I think the extra pulmonary, is more Madam, of the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, the media standard lymph node tuberculosis, lymph we are seeing in very, very elite very class of people, population. Yeah, high elite class of people. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, thank you very much. Th thanks a lot, sir. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Lalpath Labs, I thank both the speakers, Dr. Animesh Arya and Dr. Shalom Malif, for such an elucidative and informative session. And thank you all the audience for a patient listening and asking such informative queries. For the webinar people, I would like to tell that recording of this session is available on the same site they have registered. And for the audience here, we are, the lunch is open. Thank you. <laughs>